The following is a presentation of FNX Network, fnx.network. On this episode of Casual Mode, updates regarding Dragon Ball Super, Fallout from WWE Payback and NXT TakeOver Unstoppable, the latest woes of TNA, the WrestleRoll Rewind, and as always, silly news and dumb tweets. It's episode 15, and it starts right now. It's Casual Mode with Jeremy and David, episode 15 for May 25th, 2015, Dead Man's Party. Hello everybody and welcome to Casual Mode, the podcast for geeks of all trades and masters of none. I am your host, Jeremy, and with me as always, this time from the ATL, my co-host, my tag team partner, my brother by spirit, the Batman to my Superman, David. What in the hell? <laughs> no, I'm, I'm not talking about what you were saying. I, I'm looking at, like, just outside. It's just like, what in the hell is going on out there? I don't know Holy what shit. in the hell is going on out there. <laughs> okay, apparently there is this gigantic truck. And, it, it, and it's like, I guess it kind of like, I think it crashed into something it looks like. I'm not sure. Nothing, you know, no lies lost or anything, no, 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 like, no car or anything, but crash into something like, I don't know, whatever. Something I'll never figure out. It's way too far away, and I'm not going to open the door up, because we are recording now. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, as I mentioned, David has safely made it across country into Georgia, specifically the warmer Duluth. <laughs> and I'm in, well... Still in a hotel room, unfortunately. Looking out my hotel room and seeing weird stuff. And my internet was well enough that I have been able to make it to this recording. Which, which uh, I, I am happy that he is able to make it, but I'm also in some ways kind of sad because I was kind of hoping to get to do this show with uh, the third member of Casual Mode, the uh, Dutch diva Petra. <laughs> yeah, she's currently at work right now, I believe. Sorry about that. Yeah. And by by the way, Petra, if you're listening to this, I do mean Diva in the NXT positive sense and not in the WWE oh dear she, god sense. <laughs> she seriously will have no idea what the hell you're talking about either way. Anyway, on today's show, we've got uh we've got the fallout from uh, WWE Payback and Takeover Unstoppable. Our video game section is now just a game section in general, because David's going to have a card game review for us. There's been some very weird things happening over at uh, Total Nonstop Action Wrestling, which we're going to talk about. And we have the return of the Wrestle Roll Re- Rewind, uh, the May version. Why are we not doing one for April? Because of the WrestleMania. <laughs> so... And, of course, we got silly yeah. news and dumb tweets. But I want to start us off with some really, really good news. Uh, first of all, as of the time of this recording, we are one away from 50 subs on YouTube. I know that doesn't sound a lot, but for us, getting over 50 would be a major victory. So if you haven't already, we're going to link back to the uh, reminder of our subscriber giveaway with all the details how you can enter our giveaway there. If nothing else... Spread the word. Because yeah, um, certainly someone's going to be interested in hearing us act like jackasses every week. <laughs> and me drinking like bottles of water, just trying to get my throat all moist. But yeah, if you want to gain entries into this $20 gift card giveaway, just subscribe to us on YouTube. You must subscribe to us on YouTube in order to be eligible. Also, you can gain entries by liking us on Facebook, sharing a video, up to three, and then, of course, sharing the giveaway video as well, which is a fourth one. So, yeah, you can get up to six chances to win. Six? One, two, five, six. Yeah, six. I'm good with math. See? Good with math. Yeah, and while, while it will not necessarily affect your uh, entries into the giveaway, we would also like to encourage you to uh, share these videos on Twitter as well. Uh, yeah, and... And a lot of people were probably wondering how uh, we're going to determine the winner. And, well, I have uh, set up the uh, ground rules for that. Um, starting, well, it's going to be tomorrow. I will choose five names 
from the current number of drawings, basically. Uh, so those five numbers, whatever they are, will be put in as into this little dice. And I'm going to roll a D20 dice, basically, to determine a winner. And they get to choose one number for each entry that makes it into the dice number. So, for example, if you have six entries right now and say I end up getting two of your numbers, you get to choose two numbers on the dice. And then we roll it on the June 15th episode, and whatever number comes up is the winner. So, to those of you who have already entered, best of luck. To those of you who haven't entered, please do. I mean, the more entrants we have, the the better, really. As a matter of fact, how about, Jeremy, I roll up the first person who gets to determine a number? Sure, go ahead. All right, I'm going to get my little randomizer here. All right, and now... Features made of virtual insanity. Sorry. (laughs) Well, I'm going to go ahead and press the backspace button here. As soon as I press the enter key, I will know what number pops up, and I will tell you who the first person to determine a number is going to be. Drum roll, please. Congratulations to Caleb Gongre. I, I hope I got that name right. Caleb Gongre, you have the first number on the D20 roll. So I will be contacting you to get a number. Want me to do one more, Jeremy? Sure, why not? All right, we'll do one more. Drum roll. Drum roll, please. Sakura Aya, congratulations. You have earned a number. I will draw three more numbers uh, after the show, and they will receive uh, the chance to pick a number from 1 to 20 in the order that I have chosen them, basically. By the way, if that drum roll so, sound, sounds like sounds pretty much just like me tapping on a desktop, yeah, it's because it was. <laughs> yeah, we need a drum roll wave file or something like that. Yeah, and we'll do, probably we'll do it for a future show. Let's, lo- let's leave it this way for now. Uh, All right. Anyway, starting off the show with some really, really good news, especially for those of us who are Dragon Ballers. Yes, that is now the official term for fans of the Dragon Ball franchise. Dragon Ballin'! Uh, of course, we know the new anime series, uh, Dragon Ball Super, is going to be coming out. But, for the first time since uh, Dragon Ball Z concluded, there's going to be a Dragon Ball manga series based on Dragon Ball Super. So, <laughs> basically, this is pretty much the death blow to GT here because GT didn't get the didn't get the manga adaptation, <laughs> and and even better, it is actually being written by Akira Toriyama himself. So again, Ouch. death rung to GT. Yeah, it well, is. Well, that's going great. To- I think Frieza and Cell look stupid in that anime. I'll be honest with you. Yeah, it is going to run in uh, V Jump, and uh, if you don't think that the American publication of Shonen Jump is eventually going to pick it up, you're crazy. Uh, well, <laughs> in other related news, uh, Toei has announced the uh, open and end credit songs for Dragon Ball Super. Uh, we do not have the songs yet released to the public, but the Opening song is going to be by Kazuya Yoshi. Uh, it is entitled Chozetsu Dynamic. And the ending song is called Hello, Hello, Hello by a Japanese ma- band with a very interesting name, Good Morning America. <laughs> I'd love to know the story behind that one. Me too. Well, I was watching ABC one day. I'm just kidding. <laughs> like I said, they have not yet been released to the public, but... If you don't think they won't be released sometime around the official release of Resurrection F or right alongside the actual debut of the show, you hear crazy. Um, on On the post that we are actually going to link to in the show notes, in order to tide you over, there is a song on the Resurrection F soundtrack done by Momoyer Clover Z, who most recently has been best known for uh, Moon Pride, the uh, theme to Sailor Moon Crystal. And they also did a pretty rocking cover of uh, Moonlight Densetsu. So, they are... That name is familiar. (laughs) 
Yeah, so th- this is basically the second Toei property, major Toei property, anime property, that they are being tied to. Which makes me wonder if the record label that they're a part of isn't owned by Toei. But, yeah, if you watch the uh, video of uh, their song Pledge of Z that is linked on that, it- it's really, really, in- <laughs> it's a really cool video. In fact, it's got members of the band actually dressed up as various different uh, Dragon Ball Z characters, uh, including one dressed up as Goku, one dressed up as Vegeta, one dressed up as Piccolo, and uh, my favorite, the one dressed up as Future Trunks. <laughs> the the one dressed up as Future what, Trunks is just all of them. you. I think I remember them now. I think I remember them from a video four years ago. Uh, I remember writing them off as some kind of, you know, one of those time Japanese girl bands that kind of just are there to please the demographic that they're supposed to be pleasing. Tradi- this is traditional Trans- Japanese Thomas. pop idol kind of thing. Yeah. Um, for those who don't know, just go check the analytics of basically any YouTube video that involves AKB48. <laughs> or... or- <laughs> Or, uh, we've mentioned him on the show before, and it's worth bringing him up again. Gaijin Goomba did a really interesting video. I forget if it was on the uh, Game Theory channel or on his personal channel, but it was basically about uh, Japanese pop idols, and specifically Hatsune Miku. Right. Right. And And then they talked about actually one of the AKB48 stories, I believe, as well. Um, Yeah, they're fairly different i'm gonna i'm gonna i want to put this aside for a later date but i will say that this is definitely very different from what they normally do regarding japanese girl bands over there yeah we won't go into heavy detail but it's usually more of a very disposable kind of area yeah i mean i mean it might be something that we might save for a mini or something like that Sometime down the road, we could talk about it maybe closer to Resurrection of F in America. We could talk about that. Um, yeah, and it would probably also give me a little extra time to gush even more about Sailor Moon Crystal because it's been a pretty good anime so far. Although the Black Moon Saga is kind of dragged. I'm going to just have to take your word on that because I kind of stopped after episode five. Too much stuff to do. I'm the busy one. <laughs> I'm trying to be busier. It's not working sure. yet. Anyway, uh, of course, we mentioned we have all these wonderful different outlets in reference to our subscriber giveaway, but if you just want to leave us a comment, let us know what you like, uh, what you think we can do better, as long as you're nice about it, or if you just want to find ways that you can uh, share the show with your friends, we have a myriad ways to do that. David, if you would. Casualmodepodcast.com, one site. You can just go to all of our links there. Uh, uh, check us out on Twitter. I am at Zero Sage Harcoya. I'm at Shadowbird712. And, of course, I hardly ever use my Twitter, though. But I am on Facebook, facebook.com slash Podcast. the giant YouTube link, the giant iTunes link. Also on StumbleUpon and Instagram. Yeah, Instagram. Yeah, Instagram.com slash Casual Mode Podcast. We put pictures up there every now and again. We had uh, and one as intro- have me, I have a personal Pinterest. <laughs> well, I have one Zero too, but I really... Yeah, I have one too, but I really... I have no it. idea. <laughs> I, had a, I had a Pinterest account apparently like two years ago, and it pretty much just stayed there. Zero Sage Harpoya was the... Uh, Pinterest account, so... It's been, it's been so long since I've used mine, I can't even remember what it is. But anyway, uh, we are expanding out the uh, g- video game segment into a general game segment as of this episode, because, among other things, we've got a review of a new card game that David will tell us about in the next segment. Yeah, and, and before, we, uh, before we go close to the segment... Jeremy, allow me to talk about this. Um, a lot of people have been asking about that. Well, a few people have been asking me about this. But yeah, over the last couple of weeks, I have been kind of, you know, a little bit less uh, vulgar than I normally am. 
because I've been pretty much, you know, working on getting out of Vegas and getting to a new job and a new life and everything. Yeah, so, yeah moving, I, I moving is a very, very tiring thing to do. Yeah, and, and it's a little bit more serious than normal for me, so I tend to be less vulgar as a result. Let's change that. Here is what I think of... And that's what I think of the show 19 Kids and Counting. Which, by the way, thankfully is canceled after that one guy molested a bunch of little girls as a teenager. <laughs> yeah, now the most embarrassing show left on TLC is Here Comes Honey Boo Boo. <laughs> Petition to rename the Learning Channel into the Languishing and Embarrassment Channel. Sounds great. I'll start a petition right now. I'll put the link below. <laughs> anyway, um, it's the game segment of the show. <laughs> And, uh, of course, we're going to start off, as we always do, with what we're playing. David, uh, have you been playing anything while you've, oh, while you've been uh, on the road? The Honey Boo Boo Trading Card Game. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no, I have been playing a couple of things on the road. Um, but mostly I've been trying to get to learn a foreign language through Duolingo. Great software, by the way. Uh, there is one, one game I have been playing, but it's more of a card game, and we can talk about it a little bit later. It's called Force of Will. Uh, we'll be talking about that later in the show, and I'll talk about it. It's, uh, just, it, it's a pretty fun game to play. I kind of wish that there was a computerized version of it, but there isn't. And I played a little bit of Five Nights at Freddy's, which, by the way, I finished the game. You know, they're making a fourth one. Yeah, I know. Just when you think think you're done, they pull you back in. Well, I haven't even finished the two and three yet. I know I finished Five Nights at Fuck Boys one and two. What? And I still gotta do Five Nights at Fuck Boys three. What? Oh, yeah, you don't know about Five Nights at Fuck Boys? This is literally the first I've heard of it's that. It's a fan made parody of Five Nights at Freddy's, and it's basically you are playing the enemies, whoever the enemies were of that particular, of the game that it's parodying, whether it be Five Nights at Freddy's 1, 2, or 3, and you're going out and pretty much just shitting all the cameras and causing debauchery everywhere. I should not be surprised. By the way, I, th I thoroughly expect someone out there will probably send us a comment or something that there is actually a Honey Boo Boo card game. No, no, please don't. Please, I am not, I am not, no, just no. Uh, I have been playing six, seven years since I, it's been six, seven years since I played a card game after force of will. Well, you know, after I had learned how to play force of will, I don't want it to be another six, seven years before I, you know, <laughs> go back into it. <laughs> anyway, uh, I of course have been playing the usual things, uh, Shin Megami Tensei 4, Fire Emblem Awakening. I have been playing a little more of Mario Golf World Tour as well as well as uh, the Advanced Tour version. Uh, been doing some of the uh, tournaments there just because I felt like firing it up again for the first time forever. But uh, the most notable thing that I've been playing is that I have been playing uh, Dragon Ball Xenoverse quite a bit. And, well, David, my character has realized the legend. She has ascended to new levels of power. She has become the thing that the likes of which Frieza and Kula fear. Universe tremble before her, for Albireo Darkstar has become a Super Saiyan. Ally to casual mode! See. Nightmare to you! Just Super Saiyan? Well, I haven't been able to unlock Super Saiyan 2 or, or Super Vegeta 2 yet, because I I just got done with the Cell Saga. And it's only a Super Saiyan. And I worked hard oh, yeah. to get that Super Saiyan, damn it. Well, <laughs> well the uh, people that helped me out on the online parallel quest worked hard i worked kind of hard and <laughs> anyway it doesn't matter she's a super saiyan princess now so instead of being an auburn haired badass 
She is a golden-haired badass, and you will respect her. <laughs> what? And uh, and also uh, and also after dabbling a little bit with her master being Krillin, she is uh, upgraded to a more, shall we say, perfect master. Uh... Cell. Her master is Cell. <sighs> oh, that's that's actually kind of cool. Yeah. Anyway, new releases for the coming week. Um, an action RPG, Magica 2, uh, not related to the uh, anime Puella Magia e Madoka Magica, uh, is coming out for the PS4 and the PC on the 26th. Uh, Octodad, Dadliest Catch, is coming to the Vita, in case, you know, there's anyone out there who actually has a Vita, also on May the 26th. Also on May 26th, Ultra Street Fighter the Fourth, Ultra Street Fighter Four coming for the PS4. Cat Lateral Damage was, which is this uh, interesting game that I believe was uh, part of Steam Greenlight, where you get to play as a cat that wrecks stuff. It's coming out for PC, Mac, and Linux on the 27th, and you know what? We'll go ahead and go all the way through, uh, all the way through the month of May, since most of these are going to come out before the next episode anyway. Um, Hyper Dimension Neptunia Rebirth 2 Sisters Generation for the PC on May the 29th. Uh, if you don't know what that is, it's basically kind of this anime-ish RPG where you play as characters based on video game consoles. Yes, okay. Moe Anthropomorphizations of Video Game Consoles. That is a thing. And, of course, the one that uh, I honestly wish that by some miracle I would be able to get, Splatoon for the Wii U on May the 29th. And, in fact, uh, today, later today, uh, on the recording day, there is going to be one more uh, global test fire before Splatoon is officially released. And, if at all possible, you can bet your ass I'm going to get in on that. We have uh, some updates for you on... Uh, the uh, Nintendo E3 news that we gave you last week. Uh, we do have the official dates for the qualifiers, which unfortunately neither one of us are going to get to go to because they're just too far out of the way for us. Uh, qualifiers, yes. yeah, qualifiers are going to be from 10 a.m. to 7 p.m. local time on May the 30th at the following Best Buy locations: uh, 1717 Harrison Street in San Francisco. Uh, 10760 Northwest 17th in Miami, Florida, which is the closest one to David. Ten hours away, though, so... Ten hours away? Yeah. <laughs> uh, 12905 Elm Creek Boulevard North in Maple Grove, Minnesota. Uh, the closest one to me, 9378 North Central Expressway in Dallas, Texas, which is about five hours away, so not really all that great for me. Um, another one in California, Torrance, California, 3675 Pacific Coast Highway. Uh, Schaumburg, Illinois, which I imagine is probably around the, like the uh, Chicago area, 900 East uh, Golf Road. Uh, Long Island City, New York, 50, 5011 Northern Boulevard. And Tacoma, Washington, 2214 South 48th Street. Uh, keep in mind, though, you're probably going to want to get there really, really early because the first 750 eligible attendees in line at each location will be provided with a wristband to compete. Registration will begin at those locations at 9 a.m. local time. And, of course, you can go on to E3Nintendo.com to see the official rules. And the, Sorry, uh, 750? Seriously? Yeah. And, and the uh, official... That's how you determine your world champion based on who can get up at five in the morning to stand in line for four hours. Well, the actual competition will actually be on a game for the uh, Nintendo 3DS uh, called uh, Ultimate NES Remix. There is a championship mode in there, which I have actually seen some people who are who are noted uh, video game enthusiasts actually using that to kind of train. Uh, of well, course, they will have the games and systems there. You do not have to bring your own game. You do not have to bring your own system. 
But yeah, if you are able to get to any of these qualifiers and you are able to get in as one of the first 750 attendees, uh, best of luck to you and a very special best of luck to uh, Screw Attack's stuttering Craig, who is really pushing to hopefully be one of the uh, competitors in the World Championships simply because he's that big of a video game freak. And yeah, unfortunately, because I was going to go, but because of my... Uh issues with regarding you know my job is starting this week and all i don't think that they would let me off a whole day just to go down there spend the night at a hotel room go over saturday morning and play the game and then yeah it it just wouldn't work and as for me i just do not have the monetary resources to head down to dallas but yeah so i guess we'll have to make that up with something else jeremy (laughs) How about the Pokemon Regionals down in Athens, Georgia? I'm going to be there instead for the 31st, covering the VGC Regionals. Just as long as you make sure you take pictures and post them to our Instagram. and uh, well, I, I will try. Yeah. <laughs> Which, by the way, I still have to post the pictures of my trip on that Instagram, but I still don't know how to upload shit over there. I can't sign into it. But uh, I'll, 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 I'll get you the... I'll get you the information off uh, off recording. Okay. Anyway, uh, you did mention earlier the card game Force of Will that you uh, experienced during your recent uh, sojourn around uh, Atlanta to uh, kind of get your bearings. And uh, yeah, if you would talk it, more about that. Yeah. So basically, uh, the game of Force of Will is supposed to be the uh, answer to some of the problems that Magic the Gathering has. Uh, for those of you who know what Magic the Gathering is, it is the most popular trading card game, bar none, that there is. There are professionals playing this game, making probably twenty, thirty thousand dollars a year, just in prize money alone. That's not even counting sponsors. Um, but Force of Will is a game where, unlike Magic the Gathering, you cannot get what they call mana screwed. Now, mana screwed in Magic the Gathering means that with your opening hand, when you draw a certain amount of cards up, I assume that most of my audience here knows how to play a trading card game. When you draw your initial hand, you need lands in order to play spells in Magic the Gathering. Well, if you only have like one land or worse, no lands, that's called being mana screwed. If you only get two lands throughout the entire game, or, you know, maybe even three lands, not enough to get the types of spells that you need, that's also called being mana screwed. Basically, the term mana screwed can be uh, of any any type. Force of Will kind of fixes that by making the lands, which are called stones in this game, their own separate deck. And allowing your ruler to have the ability to send out one of those stones every day turn, which is actually, by the way, very innovative and very genius. It's kind of what Duel Masters tried. Instead of of doing uh, separate stones into a separate deck, they just made the cards their own mana producers, which uh, I guess kind of worked, but at the same time, a lot of people didn't feel like sacrificing certain cards for it. This is kind of a more straightforward way of just getting rid of the uh, entire mana capability entirely from your deck and just putting it in the separate pile in the zone. Sounds like that would make it a little bit easier to pick up for newer players too. It is actually, yes. And another thing that is the reason why it's booming so much here, at least in the Atlanta area is because of the card art. The card art is absolutely amazing. Frankly, to me, it's a little bit too moe for my tastes. Um, There is a lot of uh, fairy tales, fairy tale cards that are put into this. For example, I have a part Little Red Riding Hood and part Wizard of Oz deck that I made, which was mono green. Uh, it's the same colors, white, green, blue, red, black. And then there's like a moon land that you can also create out of it. Yeah, I don't quite get the moon one yet because that's part of one of the newer sets. There's been three sets that's been out right now. But overall, I mean, the game is very fun to play, and I might actually go through a tutorial if anyone is actually interested about learning how to play this game. It's got a lot of uh, Magic the Gathering and Hearthstone elements mixed in with a little bit of Yu-Gi-Oh, at least as far as, like, how the scoring is concerned. 
the game itself is pretty fun. Uh, I personally recommend it for anyone who wants to play a new trading card game that just came out like a you know several months ago that is just trying to get off the ground. Uh, I would suggest you don't buy the theme starter decks. I made that mistake of spending twenty dollars to buy a theme starter deck only to find out all the cards in it are banned. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> yep. The only cards that you can actually use are the stones to produce. You know, they're just basic stones. So yes, if you're going to buy it, be sure to buy yourself a booster pack or two, or in this case, you know. Plenty enough so that you can get the stones that you need. I recommend getting a box. Boxes are we're only like about a hundred to one hundred ten dollars, depending on the place that you go to. It is a very nice trading card game. Like I said, one of the downfalls of the game is that it's still kind of small, so you might find it hard to find people to play with against. But it is picking up very quickly. I do like that uh, you can't get mana screwed in the game, and that. The scoring style is like Yu-Gi-Oh, which was actually one of the few things that have kind of kept Yu-Gi-Oh relevant is that different scoring style that it has. It, it, it also is a game that doesn't really take itself all that ser- seriously as evidenced by the fact that it does have the Moe art. Although when David showed me what the cards look like, every time he showed me one of the uh, one of the uh, main uh, car- cards, what were they called again? <laughs> Rulers. Yeah, one of the ruler cards. My comment was, why does she look like Eris for every single one? <laughs> oh, I got two girl cards. There are also, you know, there are plenty of other rulers for different colors. Plenty of male rulers and, you know, demon rulers and stuff like that that you can use in your decks. But, yeah, overall, I really like the game. It is very fun to play. It's got a lot of really good cards, a lot of really good, you know, features to it and honestly it could overtake Yu-Gi-Oh as the number two card game Uh, and I think also something that works in its favor is that while there have been some card games that have kind of put fairy tale archetypes as cards into it like Yu-Gi-Oh this one is built around literature so that gives it kind of kind of a kind of a little unique quality to it because it is entirely literature based right now now my best deck is my mono green deck and right now i in my opinion at least green is the strongest color um i wanted to make it green red so that i can make a little bit of a build up mana build up like i normally do in magic to summon powerful spells it's not as easy to do in this game you can't just mana ramp the way that you can in uh magic the gathering with elves and stuff. With this game, you kind of have to take things a little bit more slowly. You kind of have to, you know, manage your uh, mana curve, as they would call it, a little better than in Magic the Gathering, where you can't just, some, you know, mana ramp for four or five turns and then summon one big spell after another after another. At the same time, it doesn't have the same balance that Magic the Gathering has yet, but it is definitely more balanced than Yu-Gi-Oh! Like, like that's without a doubt. So yeah, overall, I do recommend this card game, and I might put up a mini, you know, video on it to show how the game is played, if people are interested. Yeah, he did a little demo of it uh, before the show, before the recording of the show. I I got to watch it, and it it was really easy to uh, follow through. Yep, that's our game segment. We've got a lot to talk about in sports and sports entertainment next segment, including WWE Payback, TakeOver Unstoppable, and, oh, TNA, how you continue to disappoint. Oh, yeah, we're actually going to talk about TNA in this podcast. Awesome. Which makes this a very rare episode, indeed. Yeah, I know. Speaking of, here's what I think of Vince Russo. So TNA sucks. <laughs> yes. Yes, it does. Uh, sports segment. We're briefly going to go into uh, NBA playoffs because uh, the conference in my finals actually did end over our uh, kind of nine-day midseason hiatus. Uh, 
which is still shorter than some other misuse and hiatuses, Power Rangers. <laughs> and we're we're actually two games each into each of the uh, conference finals. And it looks like after the uh, six and seven game series that we had in the conference semifinals, the conference finals are going to be pretty much complete obliteration. In fact, uh, as of this moment, uh, Cleveland is up 2-0, and Atlanta's had some key injuries. And uh, Golden State is just stomping all the heck on to uh, Houston 2-0. So those could end up being over very, very quickly. But right. enough about that. Let's talk sports entertainment, shall we? Um, first, before we get into uh, Payback and TakeOver Unstoppable, I want to actually uh, let you all know something very, very interesting uh, from uh, another podcast, one that I listen to uh, quite a bit, uh, Chris Jericho's Talk is Jericho. Uh, recently, he had uh, Prince David, better known in NXT as Finn Balor, and one of the things they talked about is how the name Finn Balor came to be. And me being partially an etymology geek, partially a mythology geek, is really kind of interesting. Because okay. Balor is... In Celtic mythology, the one-eyed demon king, which goes along with, you know, his whole eldritch abomination demon thing that he has on his entrances at the special events. Right. Right. And as for the Finn part, well, part of it is from his dad's name, which is Finton. Everyone called him Finn for short. But also, as it turns out, uh, the arch enemy of the Balor was named Finn McCool. Hmm. So. Very interesting. Two bits of Celtic mythology that most people would not get combined into his name and into his persona. Very and, nice. and, and, and And it kind of makes sense because, like I said, you've got kind of the Finn side of him on the uh, regular shows where he's just, you know, himself. Where, you know, he does have his his entrance with the epic music and everything, but it's not really all that creepy. But right. then on the special events, it gets really, really, really atmospheric and dark, and he brings out the body paint and the, and the long tentacle-like dreadlocks, and that could be the Balor side coming out of him. So, very interesting thing there as well. Uh, also, before we get into uh, Payback and uh, TakeOver Unstoppable, uh, we would like to let you know that uh, following the departure of uh, Bill DeMott, or <laughs> departure by way of uh, propulsion due to uh, podiatal force, that is to say he got the boot, the uh, new head coach and new assistant head coach have been named for uh, the WWE Performance Center and, by extension, NXT. Uh, for, uh, former commentator, who was also the interim head coach after immediately after DeMott's departure, uh, Matt Bloom, also known as Albert A-Train Tensai, and more recently when he was on commentary, Jason Albert, is now the head coach for NXT. And this will be interesting for those of us who uh, follow independent wrestling. The assistant head coach is someone who had been employed with WWE for quite some time to uh, mainly focus on helping developing divas. Sarah Amato, better known as Sarah Del Rey. Uh, like I said, Ooh. she joined uh, WWE in 2012. Uh, since then, she has been responsible for creating, training, and developing some of the most athletic, charismatic, and confident divas, including uh, some of the ones that we really, really like, like Paige, Charlotte, Sasha Banks, Bailey, Becky Lynch, my girl. As being the assistant uh, now, not only will she still be working with Divas, but she's going to be working with the male superstars as well, which for Sarah Del Rey is not really out of the realm of, not really in the realm of unfamiliarity, considering that when she was with, say, Chikara, she regularly wrestled alongside men and against men. Mm -hmm. So if you wonder why the NXT Divas look so awesome and look like they could really take on anyone... It's probably because they're 
it's probably because there's no accident that their coach has been someone who's been known for that. Uh, con- so congratulations to Bloom and uh, Amaro, and uh, best of luck. And uh, to all the people who uh, are having the luck to uh, be trained by these two, it is our belief that you are in very capable hands. Moving on, moving in chronological order, we're going to start with uh, Payback from the 17th. Of course, we have the uh, pre-show that had uh, Renee Young, Booker T, Corey Graves, and... Oh, God, what's that other guy's name? Oh, oh, that guy that that just isn't appealing in any way whatsoever. Oh, God, what is his name? <laughs> Something Saxton. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Iron Saxton. <laughs> uh, since the pre-show is usually just a bunch of uh, recap stuff, we're going to skip through that. Uh, apparently, uh, apparently uh, one of their interviewers, Todd something or other got to interview Seamus over that, which wahoo. The uh, pre-show match, though, was uh, the Ascension versus what some people are refer- what WWE is referring to as the Mega Powers, what anyone outside of the WWE re- prefers to refer to as the Meta Powers, otherwise known as Curtis Axelmania and Macho Man Dow. Axelmania is running mild, brother. I have to say that every time I hear that. <laughs> I miss, I miss the intellectual savior. <laughs> oh man! And, and here's something even, even even more hilarious. This whole thing started off because the Ascension came out during a match between Axel and Damian Sandow, where they were both doing those respective gifts gimmicks and beat the hell out of them because they weren't impressed by their act this coming from a group that is basically the 2015 version of the legion of doom basically the legion of doom knockoffs <laughs> although the uh match uh did did actually have some really interesting commentary to it from uh, jbl because well anytime you get to throw out a reference to gilberg you're going to be having a fun time Uh, but the uh, hey, ascension, the ascension, the ascension. Hey, the, the ascension oh won. Okay, so it was on a meaningless pre-show match, but still, the ascension won. Uh, still a step down from beating the New Age Outlaws in the opening match of the Royal Rumble, but it's not yeah. Okay. Anyway, on to the I main. Mean, I mean, you guys realize these guys were champions of NXT longer than anyone else had been champion, right? Well, well, see, that's the division between NXT and WWE. NXT is the brainchild and, and the uh, pet pro- project, the labor of love from Triple H and Stephanie McMahon. WWE is Vince's domain. To see the division between those two, you need to look no farther than the NXT Divas Division and the WWE Divas Division. <sighs> Which, by the way, Gail Kim, or Gail Kim Irvine, I should say, since she is married to uh, Food Network's uh, chef Rob Irvine, one of my favorite uh, chefs from uh, Food Network, uh, actually praised Triple H for his work in NXT and slammed Vince for his work in WWE with the Divas. That just goes to show the divide. When someone who is probably never going to work with WWE respects one group of people who are with the WWE, but not the big boss. (laughs) Yeah. Anyway, on to the main show with, of course, Michael Cole, JBL, and... uh, What's that other guy's name? Uh, real annoying, uh, obsessed with juvenile canines. Oh, God, what is his name? Oh. Puppies! <laughs> yeah, puppies. That's his name, puppies. <laughs> Cold JBL and puppies. Uh, 
First match of the night for Payback was uh, Sheamus versus Ziggler. Uh, okay, let me get this straight. The first match that they have together on the pay-per-view has a special gimmick attached to it. The second is just a straight wrestling match. Have you not heard of Serial Escalation? <laughs> I, I, you know, I'm, I'm a bit old school, I'll admit. I believe that, you know, you should start out with... Yeah, I, I believe you should start out with a regular match. And then as the feud builds, then you bring out the special gimmick matches as it gets more and more heated. This one doesn't have a special gimmick to it. It's just a regular match. After the first one happened, the special... I realize this is the old school in me, but... Oh, God, that just... And also, when Sheamus gets into the ring, he always has this one point where he holds out his hands and he, and he does the whole Russell Crow. Are you not entertained? No, I'm not! I am not entertained by your new gimmick at all. Not really, no. I like you on Twitter, especially after you uh, recently congratulated your homeland of Ireland on voting for marriage equality, which, by the way, go Ireland! May marriage equality reign across the entire Emerald Isle. Looking at you, Northern Ireland. <laughs> but anyway, yeah. <laughs> Are you not entertained? Dunno, are you ever gonna drop the whole gladiator quote? <laughs> uh, so basically he's trying to be a Russell Crowe ripoff. Yeah. But during the ma- during the match, uh Ziggs actually did get his payoff from the uh Kiss Me Arse match from uh Extreme Rules. So uh hey Seamus, tell him how his ass tastes. Or or should it be tell me how tell me how me arse taste. <laughs> And that's a dated joke. Um, yeah, by about a month. <laughs> um, no, actually, it, it's dated by a few years because, I mean, how long has it been since Shaq was still in the NBA and he did that? But uh, Oh, oh, I got gotcha. you. Wow, okay, I got gotcha. you. There were nope. two spots during this match that I think may have been possible botches, uh, both on Dolph Ziggler's part. Um, at one point he did do a famouser on Seamus and went for the cover. Did not hook the leg. And of course the announce tried to cover for him but by saying he didn't have the energy to be able to hook the leg. Like, but uh, then Dolph did a cover off of a super kick and still didn't hook the leg. Pretty sure those might have been botches. But... And maybe that's just me. They they looked like botches to me because it looked like Dolph actually kind of looked like he was going to hook the leg, but but didn't quite get it. And I'm not really buying the uh, announcer cover story there. Mm. Uh, something you don't really see all that often in uh, the PG era of WWE. Uh, Sheamus actually was busted open hard way during this match, and in fact, on the subsequent uh, Raw and SmackDown, he's actually, he actually has stitches above one of his eyes at the spot where he was busted open hard way. Uh, ultimately, though, Sheamus did get the win back, so uh, odds are we're probably going to see them go one more time at, uh, at uh, Money in the Bank. Provided they're not in the Money in the Bank ladder match. And uh, the intermatch segment there uh, was, you know, the authority in there trying to basically get all their ducks in a row. And I, at this point, I am convinced that the more that they tease up the break of the authority, the breakup of the authority, rather, the less likely it is to happen. I think uh, the time that the authority actually breaks up will be about the time that we've given up on the possibility of the authority breaking up. Yeah. Which, in some ways, could be considered too late. In some ways, it could be considered better. But it's really subjective in that respect. So you expect them to be around for probably the rest of this year? Yeah, in fact, 
It is actually my theory, especially because of how they played this up on the pay-per-view, that Kane, they played up Kane's loyalty being to Triple H, specifically. Right. So, if Triple H were to, say, decide that someone else being champion is best for business as opposed to Seth Rollins... Yeah, that would drag out the authority angle even further, wouldn't it? Uh, aside from that, it it would really kind of put the point in. And I still to this day think that all this dissension between Kane and Rollins has really... I, I really think that storyline-wise, Kane has been working on Triple H's orders and has been ordered to do whatever he has to in order to make Seth Rollins a stronger champion. And that any any direct on-camera orders otherwise are a part of that play. Then why would you explain that stipulation? Because it's a part of it's a part of the masquerade. I don't completely get it. A, Triple H doing that is part of kind is part of showing wrong Rollins that, for now, the authority has its back. Oh, I gotcha. So, but I, I as much as they're playing up Seth Rollins being just this cocky, in some ways insubordinate little shit, there is going to come a time when the authority is going to turn on him. I know it's coming. It might actually make him more interesting than watching paint dry, so... And I'm going to go out on a limb, and I'm going to say it's going to happen somewhere around SummerSlam. Probably. Anyway, the two out of three falls match for the Tag Team Championships. Uh, New Day, the champions, versus Kid Cesaro. Uh, When the New Day came out, of course, they did their whole heel thing of uh, basically ripping the city the new, new one. Although it should be noted that with uh, with uh, societal issues being what they are in this day and age, especially in Baltimore, pretty sure that city that that city has bigger issues than the fact that the Orioles have not ever won the, the World Series. Yeah, but of course they can't use that because it would be kind of awkward if so, they, Jeremy. Did they rip them a new day? Oh. Uh, a new day hole. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> I do like Kid and Cesaro's new rain gear. It definitely makes them look more cohesive as a unit because, uh, you know, normally with these, you know, teams that are basically two guys thrown together, they keep their own individual looks so they don't really look all that unified. Uh, right. Case in point, when uh, Jericho and the Big Show were a tag team, um, you know, you would you would still have you know the Big Show in his singlet, and Jericho would be coming out in his nice business suit and all that. But I don't think Jericho would look good in a singlet, honestly. <laughs> very true. Although you know, DDP yoga. Um, <laughs> I'm just saying, man. I but, mean, seriously, but, coming out of matching singlets, that will just destroy the ratings right there. Well, maybe not matching singlets, but having, you know, gear that looks kind of similar to each, uh, each other is, is something I would prefer that they do with tag teams, even if they are basically just two guys that you threw together because you didn't really have anything else to do with. <laughs> so, like I said, the ring gear for Kid Cesaro definitely gives more cohesion Co- ah, cohesion to them as a tag team. Yeah. Uh, there were some really good spots in there. Um, leading up to the... Uh, well, there was one point where uh, I believe it was Cesaro held up... Uh, I forget which member of the New Day. may have been Big E up in a long suplex... And uh, Tyson came up off of the top rope to uh, do a spiking suplex combo with him. After that, it was the uh, swing drop kick, and uh, Kid and Cesaro took the first fall. At that point, 
You know how we mentioned that the New Day should probably try and deploy Freebird rules? Xavier Woods actually tried to invoke that during the match after the first fall. They, <laughs> they didn't let him do it. But the fact that the WWE is acknowledging that Freebird rules were a thing is kind of nice. Yeah. Although, really, why not? I mean... Probably because Kofi and Big E are the two bigger threats right now of the New Day. Kofi is the high flyer, Big E is the power. Xavier was just kind of there. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. Uh... Moving on, uh, the New Day did take the second fall off of a uh, power slam and leg drop uh, combo maneuver. So, another uh, nice little spot there. Uh, at this point, uh, Cesaro was just knocked out outside of the ring. And uh, Tyson Kidd, they were isolating and just beating on him like crazy. In fact, it was actually a kid who took that uh, pin on that second fall. Uh, Cesaro did eventually come back in on a hot tag and uh, got a uh, got a near fall off of what I can best describe as a pop up European uppercut. That sounds pretty. That sounds pretty awesome, honestly. Yeah. But, I, did, I did not watch this match, by the way. Just just so anyone knows. But uh, the match kind of ended a little weirdly because Xavier Woods at, at one point snuck in while the referee was distracted uh, and uh, rolled up, I want to say it was, it was uh, Cesaro in a way that basically obscured the fact that it was in fact Xavier Woods and not Kofi Kingston. The referee counted the pinfall and awarded the third fall to the New Day. So the tag team, the tag team champions do retain with an asterisk. <laughs> well, you know, that's kind of how most heel champions keep their titles. And, so, and, yeah, and it was, it was at this point on my notes that uh, I wrote something very, very ironic, seeing as uh, what is going to be announced uh, later on. The, have you realized we have never had a six-man tag team elimination chamber match? No. Wouldn't that know. be really awesome to see? Like, like have two, three-person team? Like, it would have been perfect for this particular feud, because you would have the New Day on one side each in one individual pod. And then you'd have Kid, Cesaro, and a partner of their choosing. I would prefer it to be Natalia, but Vince would never let that happen. That would actually be interesting because that would make Natalia the first woman ever in the elimination chamber, so. Yeah. And and do that, you know, by traditional elimination rules. You know, just like you would have a, an elimination six man tag match, except right. in the elimination chamber. But the match would end when one team is eliminated rather than last man standing. I don't know. I would rather it be last man standing because then you could, because then you could, you know, you could have a three on one advantage. You could have a two on one advantage. You could have it be whittled down one on one. There, there are so many different ways that it could end up. No, but then you could have it so that the last two men standing are from the same team. Well, not necessarily. Uh, well, well, if the last two they men wouldn't stand- book it that way, but they could. If the last two people are, if the last two people standing are from the same team, then that team wins. I mean, yeah, that's, what that, I'm that, to say. that's that's obvious. When, yeah, yeah, it ends when one team is eliminated. Is what I'm saying. That, like, oh, series. yeah, that's what you meant. Yeah, yes. yeah, I get what that means. When one team is entirely eliminated, then it ends. Yes. Yeah. Or they could do what they're going to do for Elimination Chamber now with the tag team division and just try to shove three people into one pod. <laughs> that would be funny. Actually, I, I, I'm pretty sure one of the New Day will actually be locked out. I, I, I'm pre- Yeah, I'm pretty sure they... Well, let's put it this way. If they put Xavier Woods shoved into the pod with Big E and Kofi, then they have to also do the same with El Torito for the Los Matadores 
and Natalia for Kit and Cesaro. Which would make it the first midget and female ever in the Elimination Chamber. Which is why it's not going to happen. <laughs> that makes sense. Anyway, uh, moving on. Ryback versus Bray Wyatt. You know, with my predilection for smaller, more agile wrestlers, you would not expect that I would normally like what is generally referred to as a hoss fight. So it's probably going to surprise you when I say that Ryback versus Bray Wyatt was a really damn good hoss fight. Yeah, it was. And actually, the cheers were a bit split, which, I mean, you hear the rumors of Bray Wyatt eventually going face. There is evidence why there, why those rumors exist. <laughs> um, at one point, uh, Ryback actually went to the top rope and did a frog splash, or as I'm going to call it, the Ryback African Bullfrog Splash. Because have you seen African Bullfrogs? Those things are fucking huge. <laughs> I've never seen one, no. So, if Ryback ever uses that again, and the WWE does not use the term African Bullfrog Splash, or at least the Bullfrog Splash, I, I will be highly disappointed. Actually, I won't be that surprised, because that means they don't listen to this show, and let's face it, why would they? Uh... <laughs> Uh, figuring into the end of the match, though, uh, was, uh, Bray Wyatt actually exposed one of the turnbuckles, which, how long has it been in the WWE since we've had that? Uh... Since the PG era came around, exposed turnbuckles are not exactly a common thing. No, it's not. And, funny part is, spoiler alert here, that happened more than once in this show. Interesting. All right. Af after that match, which, by the way, Bray Wyatt uh, took took uh, it uh, after a sister Abigail following right back coming into contact with said exposed turnbuckle. Uh, they had a promo. They had a promo uh, June fourteenth on pay per view or the WWE Network if you are actually wise with your money. Money in the bank, which means the it's the one time a year when the one person you probably didn't expect to ever possibly have a title shot will end up having the possibility of a title shot. Or this year, probably either Roman Reigns or Dean Ambrose. Uh, I got my money on uh, Roman Reigns, honestly. I'm going to go the other way with you on that. I am going to go... I think it's going to be Dean Ambrose. Mm. Either that or Roman Wayne, Reigns wins, wins the thing, wins the money in the bank, Mm -hmm. And then Dean Ambrose wins the Royal Rumble and Shield Triple Threat at WrestleMania 32. By all accounts, WrestleMania 32 is going to be an all hands on deck kind of show, so why not? Yeah. Wouldn't that be great to have for your main event? People have been calling for it anyway, partially because of, well, things that happen later in Payback. Right. Also, it should be noted that uh, Stone Cold's podcast is coming back to the WWE Network uh, June 1st after the episode of Raw. He is going to be interviewing the mad mastermind himself, the person that, uh, to some degree, David and I kind of idolize, at least when it comes to things that aren't related to money, Paul Heyman. Yeah. Yeah. Great booker, not so great accountant. Um, <laughs> let's face it if you're taking money advice from Paul Paul Heyman you're you're well you deserve what you get if you if so you take that's money that's why everyone was choosing Rusev in that first match at Wrestlemania yeah I was I was gonna say if you're taking money advice from Paul Heyman then you're probably also the kind of person who bets on scripted sports entertainment uh, <laughs> running gag uh Anyway, John Cena versus Rusev for the U.S. title. Oh, God, I missed the days when Lana held Rusev's leash and not the other way around. <laughs> and to some degree, uh, I think, judging by his entrance, I think Cena actually kind of enjoys being jeered. Yeah, I, I kind of had a feeling that a long time ago, I'll be honest with you. Anyway... 
Uh, at, at the beginning of the match, uh, Rusev, Rusev uh, actually went out to set a steel chair out and had Lana sit in it at ringside, which I thought might have been foreshadowing to what might happen on a possible turn. It didn't, but it would have been nice to see Lana go, whoop You know? Uh, at another point, a lot of this was... Uh, at least during the early stages, was Rusev being more concerned about what Lana was doing at ringside rather than actually being concerned with the match. And uh, when Lana started getting face pops a little bit later on, he went and grabbed the uh, Russian flag from ringside and then started just waving it around to get booze and then set it back down in. To which I immediately thought, you know, you've got the Russian flag. You're playing up this whole Russian superiority thing. Why did you not just use the flagpole as a weapon? That's what I was wondering. Uh, I mean, you don't even flagpole. have to use the flagpole. start stabbing Cena with it, right? You don't even have so, to use the flag side of it. Just, like, jab at him like you would with, like, you know, I, I used to with the bow staff when I was doing katas back in the karate days. You know? Yeah, I know. Yeah, I know. You, he could just, you know, stab Cena with the sharp end of the flagpole for all he knows and just, like, you know, well, I don't know. Then again, we are talking about a guy who looks like a half orc from World of Warcraft, so I mean. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, by the way, a, a little side note. You know, on these I Quit matches, they always start asking, like, ridiculously early on in the match. You know what my initial answers would be under those conditions? What's that? Well, uh, assuming uh, we're under uh, PG rules here because of the current WWE climate, my right. initial answers would be, you freaking kidding me? Followed by, <laughs> like hell I am. <laughs> Which, at one point, it was much later in the match, but John Cena actually did say hell no. <laughs> yeah. The the issue that I had was that it seemed like after every offensive maneuver by the two guys, the referee would go to them and be like, do you quit? Is that typical of I Quit matches? This is the first one I've actually watched start to finish. So Yeah, the, the, it, it, it got really ridiculous. I, I, mean, I, I can understand it after, like, really, really big spots or, or, or like, moves that are definitely, you know, aimed to be really, really hurty, uh, if you'll right. pardon the Buffy speak there. But, right. uh... Well, it's like, suplex, do you quit? No. Body slam, do you quit? No! Elbow off the top rope. Do you quit? Hell no! <laughs> I mean, come on. Seriously. Th- there were a heck of a lot of uh, steel step spots, though, in this match. Including actually bringing out... You know, most of the time they bring out the smaller top part of the steps into the ring. Yeah. In this case, they used the bigger bottom part of the steps into the ring. Hmm. And uh, unfortunately, part of the downside of doing I Quit matches in this day and age is the fact that they do shy away from blood. Yeah. So, But at one point, the, uh, the match, of course, as I Quit matches are wont to do, goes out into the crowd and into the various crawl, crawl spaces, and they actually stopped off at the tech table. At, at, at which point, John Cena even uses a laptop as a weapon, which... Oh, God, waste of a good laptop there. But, uh... But WWE... Yeah, WWE's got the money. They can afford it. Uh, I I believe it was Rusev actually tried to slam John Cena through the table, but uh, in in a nod to uh, Botchamania, uh, the table failed to break. So, uh, it must have been the tech table of Japan. Ah, yeah. I am the table! (laughs) Uh, the table did eventually break though but it it took a lot more work to get it through there so expect to see that heavily featured on on, uh, Botchamania with the accompanying uh, Metallica song Um, (laughs) one spot that was just really devastating that I saw was um, when Cena I think he just, like, suplexed or FU'd Rusev. Yeah, it was the attitude adjustment onto the area where the pyro was going on, where the pyro I was I still set. call it FU, by the way. <laughs> yeah, and then the pyro went off, and Rusev was selling it like it was burning him horribly. 
Uh, which, by the way, before that point, John Cena's ear actually got busted open. Oh, yeah. A star- looks like John Cena may be, before too long, starting to resemble uh, Mick Foley a little bit. Uh, get a whole cauliflower ear. This was really a trash-the-set kind of match, as I Quit matches sometimes are. Because at, at one point, at one point, like you alluded to earlier, Rusev takes off one of the turn turnbuckle covers and then unscrews the top rope and was going to use like the spike there as a weapon but it got reversed into John Cena using the rope in an STF actually he did actually Rusev did actually use the rope as a weapon before that and actually knocked John Cena out apparently though you actually do have to say I quit which is weird because I I swear to God, they have stopped an I Quit match by knockout before. I'll have to go check that, but I'm not sure about that either. I, I may be wrong, but I I swear to God, it's been done. Where a knockout equates to I Quit. Yeah. It, it, it would make sense. I mean, it would be basically the body saying what the mind will not, you know? Mm. But at at the end of it, as I said earlier, uh, John Cena uses the rope and gets Rusev in the STF, and Rusev starts bulk, barking out things, presumably in Bulgarian. And Lana grabs a microphone and goes up and says that he was saying he quits. No idea if this was an actual translation, or if it was just Lana speaking of her own volition to not want Rusev to be hurt anymore. Right. But at any rate, Lil Cena wins. It's an I quit match. Did you honestly expect anything different? It was a pretty damn good match though for an I quit match, I'll be honest with you. Yeah. It was actually at this point in the show that they did announce the uh, tag title elimination chamber that uh, we mentioned earlier. Two guys in one pod. Sounds like a porno. Or a really disgusting YouTube video. Uh, (laughs) Anyway, next is the uh, Divas match. Bella Twins versus uh, Naomi and Tamina. Naomi coming back out with the Zero Suit Samus boost because God knows they weren't cheesy enough at Extreme Rules. (laughs) And and the whole th- this whole thing is being set off by Naomi being really really gripey about being overlooked in the face of you know like Paige or, or AJ or the Divas Champion uh, Nikki Bella, <laughs> you know Naomi. Maybe you wouldn't be overlooked if you didn't suck. Ooh. It, you know, maybe if you stepped it up a little, actually learned to wrestle somewhat, and and and, uh, and uh, didn't sound worse than me on the mic, maybe it might not be overlooked. Just saying. <laughs> That's all I got to say about that match, aside from the fact that Naomi and, and Tamina won. Yeah. Still trying to figure out why they don't hold Divas title matches. In pay-per-views. Because that would make too much sense. Uh, Instead, they just feature both the Bella Twins going out and facing two random divas out of nowhere. and yeah, Whatever. Uh, they had a special promo uh, in between uh, this and the next match for their new show, which is basically kind of a prank uh, show on WWE Superstars, uh, by the name of Swerved, which of course means it was actually... Uh, it, supposedly it was created by the, uh, people behind, uh, Jackass and Bad Grandpa, but in actuality, with a name like that, you know, it was created by Vince Russo. (laughs) Which means it's gonna suck on toast! That's not good. (laughs) Suck on toast? Where the hell did I come up with that? Um, did you think of a better name than Swerved? Like, I get it, you can't use punk, and you're trying to find a simil- you know, a synonym for punk. I'm pretty sure that there are plenty of other synonyms out there that would have worked better than swerved. Well, I, I mean, you could use the wrestling term ribbed, but then that might make people think that it's TVMA, or worse. 
Uh, <laughs> ribbed for your pleasure. Uh, <laughs> Then again, the WWE Network also has a show show hosted by uh, Jerry Springer called Too Hot for TV, which, among other things, had one episode where they uh, talk, talked about uh, Mark Henry's uh, transgender confusion, uh, which, in retrospect, is really more uncomfortable than anything else. Yeah. The Attitude Era. Some of it was really funny. The rest of it is offensive in retrospect. <laughs> anyway, King it, Barrett it versus it was so awesome. Yeah, King Barrett versus Neville. I just realized something. What's that? Wade Barrett, since he became the king of the ring, with the way his voice is, he sounds a lot like uh, Scar from The Lion King. He sounds an awful lot like Jeremy Irons. I don't think he's changed much with his new king persona, I'll be honest with you. I know, but the way he's playing up the king and the whole haughty, haughty thing and, you know, I am the king, not not you, I am the king. I swear to God, he sounds like Scar from The Lion King. <laughs> All we need is for him to say say something akin to feed me your rage and, and there you go. There's the successor hey. to Jeremy Irons for you. <laughs> to me, it just sounds like, you know, they took Bad News Barrett and shoved a crown in his head. Uh, these two really do have really great chemistry in the ring, though, I have to admit. Yeah. So far, every match that they've had together has been pretty darn good. Unfortunately, this one ended by King Barrett deciding he gives no fucks anymore and just walking off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thankfully, uh, for those of us who wanted to see some actual payoff... King Barrett may not give any fucks, but neither does the man who gravity forgot. Hmm. So we did get Neville uh, getting his uh, ultimate vengeance, including, if I remember correctly, a uh, red arrow right at the end there. The only yeah. thing I he didn't do that I wish he would have is take the king's scepter and break it over his knee. That's what I would have done. But... What do I know? I'm not a WWE superstar. And as evidenced by my anti-WWE Tough Enough video, I should not ever be. Yeah. I still don't know why you made that, man. I I did that because, you know, there were some people who actually submitted quote-unquote funny videos to Tough Enough. Me, I didn't want to just do a funny video. I actually wanted to turn the concept on its head. By being the by being one person who, instead of trying to be silly as a way to get into WWE, be silly by full cognizance that I will never ever be in WWE. <sighs> a baby bunny. Whatever. Hard as a cotton ball. Anyway, last but not least, the fatal four way for the WWE WWE World Heavyweight Championship. God, that's hard to say. Champion Rollins versus Orton versus Reigns versus Ambrose. And I figured out something about Dean Ambrose's character. What's that? You know, they they call him the lunatic fringe. Like, he, he's this, you know, sociopathic or, or, or psychotic crazy guy. That's not really his gimmick. He is basically the living embodiment of the internet wrestling community. <laughs> I say this because... For one thing, he is completely lampshaded like, you know, like basic things that happen all the time in wrestling, just nonchalantly. Like when they had the contract signing and he sets the table up in the corner and says, well, we all know where this is going. <laughs> By the way, it dips <laughs> on the table. <sighs> he, is, he is like the living embodiment of the things that are actually somewhat enjoyable about being a part of the internet wrestling community. Yeah. He gives no fucks. Uh, here's something weird for you in this match. Normally it takes some while in matches that Seth Rollins has involved for J&J security to get involved. They started getting off in- into it really quickly by trying to take out uh, 
two of the competitors really quick so that it was just basically a one-on-one -on -one match for a while. Um, there was actually a, a brief alliance, though, uh, fairly early on into the match by Ambrose and Reigns, but it was halted by Kane deciding to get to step into the ring and uh, do his thing, which, of course, it being a fatal four-way, does not create a disqualification. Still never understood that multi-people matches, suddenly no DQs, no count-outs, seriously? <laughs> well, it's kind of by necessity. I mean, otherwise, otherwise you'd have three people fighting in the ring, one guy laying out, laying outside, and that one guy on the outside would get counted out, and the match would be over. You do that, you got a riot on your hands. No, you just eliminate the person. That like, would actually... Well, see, the thing is, that would actually make sense. But it... <laughs> but, yeah. And, in fact, I think ECW actually did their four-way dances that way. With elimination. Yeah. But in WWE, multi-man matches are instead one giant, for lack of a better phrase, clusterfuck, but in an entertaining way. Ring of Honor requires all their multi-man matches to be elimination. Just saying. Yeah, well, Ring, Ring of Honor also has not yet banned head had chair shots as far as I know, so they don't make all the good decisions. Anyway, uh, there were some really great spots in this match, as are, you know, kind of par for the course on yeah. multi-man matches, including kind of a teasing of uh, the reunion of the Shield when they triple power-bombed Randy Orton through the main announce table. But then... As Roman, as uh, Rollins was holding out his fist to kind of indicate a reunion of the Shield, Reigns and Kane were Reigns and Ambrose were just standing beside there with smiles on their faces, and then suddenly the smiles dropped. <laughs> and Rollins is getting that look like, "Oh fuck me!" <laughs> At which point the beatdown was on, and that actually led to. Uh, well, of course, Kane got involved on this again, but it led to Kane getting beaten down late on the Spanish announce table, which got which had been team stripped by Reigns and Ambrose, and then and then they took Rollins and did a double power bomb twice because the first one didn't break the table. <laughs> Of course, also, part of the reason why they did it twice was because after they did it once, the entire arena was going, One more time! One more time! One more time! And then, oh, Ambrose, and Rain, and, and then Ambrose and Reigns looked at each other, and Ambrose was like, just shrugged his shoulders like, Well, guess we gotta do it! <laughs> <laughs> Which, like I said, embodiment of the internet and wrestling community. <laughs> And, uh, of course, after that, they look at e each other, look at the ring, and then immediately dash into the ring to face off with each other as a one-on-one -on -one match. <laughs> Which, of course, goes to show, even though they've gone their separate ways, they've still got mad respect. So it's like, well, we've got the other two taken out. It's just you and me. Let's go. Yeah. And this actually led to the uh, boo yay spot, with the boos going for Reigns and the yays going for Ambrose. Guess you can see who the favored one in this match was. Yeah. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, during during the entirety of the pay per view, the commentators made much of Kane's loyalty to Triple H, and not Rollins. I thought this might have led to something on the pay-per-view itself, but then again, as I also mentioned earlier, the more they tease the possibility of the breakup, the less likely it's going to happen. Uh, toward the end of the match, everybody got an RKO. J&G got an RKO, and Kane got an RKO, and Reigns and Ambrose got an RKO, and then second worst pedigree ever. I say second worst because if you've ever seen China try to do a pedigree, you would agree that Seth Rollins slightly edges her out. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
So yeah, pedigree, Ron's new finisher. Why? Because Triple H. Actually kind of makes sense, though. Anyway, well, Rollins, Rollins got the pin. Un, deux, trois. And that's for our French-speaking viewers. So, Rollins retains the World Heavyweight Championship, which means Kane is still Director of Operations. Not that I really thought his job was all that much in jeopardy. On the whole, I can't say there really was anything bad on the pay-per-view. No, it wasn't. It was... Uh, I can't say there was anything, you know, super amazing start to finish anyways. Cena Rusev, I think, was my highlight of the night. My but, my personal highlight for the night actually would, of course, would be the Fatal 4-Way match because of the triple and then double powerbomb spots. The, the, yeah. That was just... If you if you didn't get to see the pay-per-view, which, by the way, we're sorry for spoiling it for, for you, but on, honestly, if you're listening to this recap and hadn't watched the pay-per-view, you're kind of taking it into your own hands. It, it is worth going back onto WWE Network and watching that match. Yeah, final ratings for me, I'm going three and a half Unicrystal Hexagrams out of five. Well above average. I'm going to go three and a half, too. It was pretty solid. I didn't see anything bad. Nothing that really stood out too much. Uh, with the exception of the Cena Rusev spots and, like you said, the Fatal 4-Way spots. So, yeah, I'll give it three and a half. So, uh, that is uh, Payback, and that's all that we've got for the WWE side. But we are not done quite yet, because, oh, TNA, we have quite a bit to talk about you. <laughs> Let, in honor of their recent addition to the creative team, uh, one William Corgan... We're going to start off with uh, Dixie Carter and the Infinite Sadness. Uh, recently, there was news on various different uh, internet news sources, uh, largely spread out by uh, one particular person who is kind of a love or hate kind of guy by the name of Dave Meltzer, saying that uh, Destination America, the, uh, the uh, high cable, digital cable high-tier channel that uh, TNA has been on since uh, leaving Spike, had provisionally decided to cancel all TNA programming after the end of September, basically when the new season would have started. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, when TNA found out about this, uh, well, they got a little bit pissy. In okay. fact, uh, to the point uh, that they issued a vague statement to other wrestling websites denying the story, and uh, also they're going to sue people. <laughs> By the way, interesting to note, the one person who didn't get a threatening email on this was Meltzer. Make of that what you will. Yeah, I think that they get the idea of going after, you know, whatever. Tony's and, made the best choices. Yeah, and, and as, as of this time, uh, TNA has actually addressed their, uh, sent emails out to their talent about this, letting them know, letting them know that, uh, that the rumors, at least their company in the line is that the rumors are unsubstantiated. But uh, the uh, rabbit hole goes a little deeper for TNA because uh, they are actually being sued for back payment by Eric Bischoff, Jason Hervey, and Eric's son, Garrett. <laughs> for $114,000, $500, and two cents. Wow. Had to get their two cents worth in there, huh? Yeah. So yeah. Uh, look, looks like so it looks like in order to pay them off, uh, some more TNA superstars won't be getting paid tonight. Tonight. <laughs> oh. I haven't seen a situation this bad since 1979. Oh. Looks like the beginning is the end is the beginning. <laughs> uh. You know, T 
TNA is a vampire set to drain. Uh, <laughs> at this point, Dixie Carter just looks like a zero. <laughs> That's the way it is, you know. Uh, it looks like TNA is just about to drown. <laughs> and looking through the eyes of Ruby, they need to try, try, try harder. <laughs> Bottom line, TNA, fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, jeez. And if you don't know what that string was about, I, I encourage you to look up uh, titles of Smashing Pumpkin songs on Google. I, I, I kind of just figured that that's what it was, honestly. Well, you know, since Billy Corgan's in there, you know. Yeah, I gotcha. Uh, TNA still sucks. And because TNA uh, is... And because TNA is not just a harbor of uh, terrible things, but also people becoming terrible. Oh, Josh Matthews, I liked you once. I actually liked you in WWE. I thought you were a great commentator. And then you left for TNA, and... Jesus, man, could you save some of that Kool-Aid for the rest of us? <laughs> because, uh, in the past, Josh Matthews has actually gotten into a Twitter war with JR, uh, where he has, uh, among other things, made fun of uh, JR's age. And uh, taking shots at WWE to JR. So, you know, that's one bit of stupidity on his part. But in addition to that, uh, Josh Matthews has uh, apparently called uh, WWE out on hypocrisy as regards to uh, the likes of uh, certain former TNA superstars who debuted in WWE, which, oh, God, that reminds me. We forgot to talk about TakeOver Unstoppable. Oh, we can get to that then. Okay. So to preface this, we're going to talk a little bit about TakeOver Unstoppable, particularly the main event match. The entire the entire event was good from stem to post, uh, including some very interesting uh, entrances for Finn Balor, uh, Tyler Breeze, and oh my god, Becky Lynch. I am in love with my Irish rocker. Yes. Oh, I should say my steampunk Irish rocker. Oh my god, she looked fantastic with dyed blazing red hair and steampunk goggles and the jacket. Oh, good lord. Someone mentioned that uh, that whole look kind of was just sort of uh, you know, inspired by uh, Magic the Gathering card of Chandra, who was one of the planeswalkers uh, of the red color, I believe. Uh, Which I mean, if that if that indeed was the inspiration for it, I think I love Becky Lynch even more. <laughs> I already kind of had a little bit of an affinity for Sasha Banks because if you look at her Twitter handle, she's got pictures of the Sailor Scouts on there. <laughs> yeah. Which, by the way, that was a fantastic match. It uh, was. Unfortunately, my girl Bex did not win. But it was a fantastic match. Both of them just brought their A game. And there was a standing ovation for Becky Lynch afterwards. Which... But I think that its purpose was meant to be an ascension match for Becky Lynch to the upper echelons of the Divas division, at least for the NXT area. Yeah. Uh, the tag team match uh, with the Natural Born Huggers versus Dana Brooks and Emma, I still don't have a name for them, was also really, really great. Uh, the tag team match, uh, you may, for those of you who thought that Carmella was eventually going to, uh, break up with, uh, the realist guys in the room or the Port Authority, depending on what you prefer to call them, uh, actually, no. Blake and Murphy are now tied with Alexa Bliss. Yeah. Oh, and by the way, I think it was Alexa Bliss that cost, uh, Amore and Big Cass the match by dropping Amore from the top rope. You don't see that very often with uh, female wrestlers these days in WWE. Yeah. So, kind of a face turn for Carmella, but also definitely a heel turn for Alexa Bliss. Yeah. Uh, 
by the way, we mentioned uh, Finn Balor and Tyler Breeze's entrances earlier. Unfortunately, the triple threat match that was scheduled ended up being a one-on-one match, which Finn Balor won. The reason for this being that Hideo Itami did end up getting injured before the show. Uh, if you look at his uh, <laughs> Twitter handle, uh, if you look at his Twitter account, he's very apologetic uh, about not being able to be there. Uh, you know, yeah. I, I don't doubt that not being able to be on a show like one of the takeovers definitely was kind of a kind of emotionally hurtful to him. But we we wish him all the best and hope he gets uh, recovered really really quickly because Hideo's awesome. Uh, like I said, Finn Balor is the one who won the match, so he is now the number one contender uh, following TakeOver. By the way, you know how I said that Rhino was going to put Baron Corbin over at TakeOver Unstoppable? Well, guess what? I was right for once! Well, it was a longer match than his ones against Bull Dempsey. Yeah. It, yeah, it was a pretty good match between the two of them, really. Yeah, it was It was. Pretty even-handed. It definitely wasn't like where he just pretty much beat the crap out of his opponent in 60 seconds, and that was it. Yeah. Uh, The main thing, though, the main event, though, first off, Kevin Owens came to the ring wearing the John Cena United States Championship shirt. Masterful troll work there. (laughs) Yeah. He had his regular KO shirt on underneath that, but he had he came to the ring with his NXT championship where, you know, the depiction of the United States championship is wearing John Cena's The Champ is Here shirt. So, yeah. masterful trolling there. <laughs> and it, it, was, it was a really great match, though. It ultimately got thrown out, though, because Kevin Owens just started destroying Sami Zayn. And then debuted Samoa Joe. And yes, that's the name he's going by in NXT. He is keeping his name, which is something that does not happen all that often. And it probably would not have happened had Triple H not insisted. In fact, I think he insisted the same for Hideo Itami. It's just in that case, he didn't get his way. Right. But and in this case, he did. And I still don't understand why WWE just doesn't let them keep their indie names. I understand it's to try to market them to the WWE brand, but really a lot of people just have difficulty, you know, with that name change. I mean, eventually they do get along. I I understand, for example, El Generico, if you're going to go without the mask, he can't be El Generico. Well, aside aside from that, with Sami Zayn, we're also trying to market to uh, uh, people of Arab, Arab descent to have someone that they can get behind who is a face. Right. Okay, but why Kevin Owens? Why didn't they just keep him Kevin Steen? That that that's a lot more intimidating of a name than Kevin Owens. I understand the KO initials and everything, but yeah, it, it's probably because of the initials. the The initials there would have been more uh, better better using and marketable mark in marketing stuff like T shirts. Ah, I gotcha. Uh, I guess but... Kill Steen Kill wouldn't be PG. But yeah, uh, Samoa Joe came out and, and stared down Kevin Owens for for a good long while, and basically stopped him from further destroying uh, Sami Zayn. So, not only do we have Finn Balor as the number one contender, and not only do we have Kevin Owens, who, by the way, spoilers from Raw and SmackDown, is going to be facing uh, John Cena at the Elimination Chamber, likely a non-title match. Uh, but now we have Samoa Joe coming in. And the fact that he kept, kept Samoa Joe is actually brings me back to what Josh Matthews, uh, was being me all uppity about. You know, WWE has been cognizant of Sami Zayn, Kevin Owens, uh, Hideo Itami and such having had, a, a wrestling experience outside of the WWE, and even as far back as Daniel Bryan, Bryan, although they didn't really recognize this until well after his days on the first season of NXT. But they don't ever mention TNA or Ring of Honor by name. Which actually makes sense. Because, for one thing, 
Ring of Honor really is pretty much the most glorified indie fed. And TNA is about as close to a competitor to WWE as Sam's Choice is to Pepsi or Coke. (laughs) It's kind of funny because actually that's how people describe TNA as generic. It, it just looks bland, it tastes bland, it feels bland. TNA, so, TNA is basically WCW 2.0, but worse. No, it's, it's generic WCW. Yeah, but Josh Matthews goes and goes off on this Twitter rant about, uh, oh, it, it's hypocritical for WWE to say that they have all this experience and not mention Ring of Honor and TNA, to which I say, why would they? Yeah, I, I I wouldn't either, and, and I'm gonna be honest with you. TNA is not the I don't think I don't consider TNA the second biggest organization anymore. I give that title to Lucha Underground now. I mean, I, I mean, it was kind of ridiculous that they basically said that Sting disappeared, appeared for basically disappeared for 14 years when he came back. When most of us in the know know he was actually in TNA. To be fair, his TNA run not really that memorable. At least not to me. I mean, the, the things I can remember the most about his run, Sting's run in TNA were, A, he was basically booked as a second-rate Undertaker, with Bound for Glory being his uh, his WrestleMania, where he won there, and usually the tam- championship. Two, that very quixotic uh, last rights match gimmick match that he came up with, where the point of the match was to lay someone on this little platform that would then be raised up into the heavens. Uh, it was against uh, Abyss when he was being managed by the Sinister Minister, uh, uh, James... God, what was his last name? Sinister Minister James something. I, I, I can't remember. And then, of course, 90 Seconds of Hell with Jeff Hardy. I think you know what I'm referring to when I mention James that. Mitchell, by the way. James Mitchell, thank you. But yeah, that the Quixotic Last Rites match, the fact that he was basically booked as a second-rate Undertaker with Bound for Glory being his WrestleMania, and the 90 Seconds of Hell with Jeff Hardy. And the Joker gimmick. Yeah. And Joker Sting, yes. Those are the only really memorable things about his run in TNA, so I can kind of understand why they wouldn't mention that, besides not really giving credence to someone who styles themselves as a competitor that is really nowhere anywhere close to being a competitor. Hell, I would say these days Ring of Honor is closer to that front. But No, Lucha Underground is number two, I think. Well, if we go by TV sections, Ring of Honor at least has more reach. Than Lucha Underground or TNA? Yes, since they're Lucha syndicated on the Sinclair. The stars and the bigger budget. Yeah, Ring of Honor has Sinclair behind them because Sinclair now owns Ring of Honor. Right. So, so, so yeah, Ring of Honor would be second in TV marketing. Lucha Underground would be second in budget. TNA would... I, I, I don't even know how you would consider them second anymore in anything. <laughs> They're certainly number two, I'll give them that. Um, but yeah, and then, to make matters worse, Josh Matthews goes on to gloat about the fact that he's getting paid all this money by TNA, which probably makes him just about the only person who's actually getting money from TNA. Well, aside from maybe Kurt Angle, you know. <laughs> I mean, they didn't even pay Eric fucking Bischoff, apparently. And yet they're paying Josh Matthews. Are you kidding me? They're paying Josh Matthews? Seriously? And what, peanuts? Well, if you look on the link that we're going to give you to the uh, this story on Cage Side Seats, uh, some people have conjectured that they are, in fact, fact paying uh, him buckets of money. <laughs> if those buckets are full of pennies. <laughs> No, 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 I got one, I got one. The little hay pennies. <laughs> if you have no pe- penny, a hay penny will do. If you have no hay penny, God bless you. <laughs> oh, wait, how about Dogecoins? 
<laughs> Doge coins. No, no, no. This is TNA. They pay in Fedora coins. Ah, gotcha. <laughs> because <laughs> Doge coins actually have some value to them. <laughs> oh, man. But yeah, TNA. Oh, God. TNA has put a bullet into their own butterfly wings. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I think I think the downfall is starting to become imminent soon as um, one AJ Styles pretty much just left TNA without even finishing that feud with Dixie that he was supposed to finish, and two Alberto El Patron, formerly known as Alberto Del Rio, telling TNA to go suck it. <laughs> Yeah. Screw you guys, I'm going to Lucha Underground. Slash Ring of Honor. Or did he go to Ring of Honor? Yeah, I think he's in Ring of Honor too. Yeah, so yeah. He would choose those two over TNA. Think about that for a second before you say TNA is the number two organization. And it's, what makes this so, what makes this really depressing is that TNA once had promise. They had the X Division. They had great feuds with AJ Styles, Christopher Daniels, Samoa Joe. They had... When Christian Cage was there, he had a really great run. He was like the one WWE guy who jumped over there that actually did good for TNA. I mean, besides Kurt Angle before he started getting involved. Before he started having drug abuse issues. <laughs> I mean, and aside from, aside from some really questionable gimmick matches like King of the Mountain, like the Gauntlet match, su- such stuff that even I wouldn't come up with them, and I've been known for coming up with some really weird match types. What about that Road to Glory series that they had, which was just giant clusterfuck? Yeah, Th- they had such promise. And then Vince Russo happened. And then Eric Bischoff happened. <laughs> and then Hulk Hogan happened. <laughs> and then Vince Russo happened again. And then Spike gave him the boot. And now we don't know what's going on with Destination America. We're not going to say with any... Since with any absolute certainty, they're probably not going to cancel them. I'll be honest with you. At, well, after the next episode, because this past episode uh, that they did uh, on the day before this recording day, they re-aired Slammiversary 2014. They they have already recorded several episodes in advance, including mel- multiple episodes that are supposed to take place. After the live event, Slammiversary 2015. And also, after the next episode that is coming this next Friday, they're moving the show to Wednesday nights. Ah. As for what's going to happen when it comes time to renew it, I will not say. Because I don't have any kind of authority on that. I don't have any ties to TNA or Destination America whatsoever. I don't have any contacts. I mean, Z-less podcasting here. But I will say this. If it does turn out that TNA gets the axe from Destination America, I highly doubt they'll be able to find another home. Uh... Which means they're either going to have to go back to the... Ooh, 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 I, got, I, got, I got one. TLC, I found your replacement. What? <laughs> TLC. Oh, okay. <laughs> Talk about the languishing and embarrassment channel. <laughs> Any, anyway, let's get ready to move on to things about wrestling that actually, to some degree, didn't suck. Because up next in the oldest established permanent floating segment. Wrestle Royal Rewind number two, Judgment Day 2006. And while we are at break, Jeremy, let me tell you about this great idea that I thought up. Oh, no. (laughs) 
So there you go. The New Day versus Tyson Kidd, Cesaro, and Natalia versus Michael Cole, The King, and JBL versus The Ascension and Kevin Owens versus the crew from Lucha Underground and an El Torito on a pole match. Think of the ratings. Thank you, Vince Russo. <laughs> Anyway, this is the uh, time of the month where we do our Wrestle Roll Rewind. Uh, of course, we skipped April because, well, we did the WrestleMania reviews back then. So, right. so we decided to jump right ahead to May. And uh, our numbers that we ended up getting took us back nine years to Judgment Day 2006. It was either that or one of the TNA pay-per-views, and to be honest, the TNA pay-per-view that we came up with really wasn't all that interesting. Is anything in TNA interesting? Not really. Interesting in the watching a car wreck kind of way. (laughs) And, you know, uh, this pay-per-view started out with uh, quoting a passage from the Book of Job, specifically Job 19.29, you know, I, I would call that uh, rather pretentious of them, but I'm the guy who wants to use Dies Ire as an entrance theme, so. Yeah. The Mozart version, by the way. Yeah. Which, if you look at the lyrics, really damn imposing. So. Uh. If you're watching this on the WWE Network and you're hearing the uh, theme song for this pay-per-view and it sounds familiar, well, I got two letters and one word for ya. C.M. Punk. Yeah. Because, so yeah, this, that. yeah, this Kill Switch Engage song was his uh, initial theme in WWE. And uh, it is probably the one Kill Switch Engage song that I don't hate. Because seriously, their cover of Holy Diver, fuck that cover. <laughs> I mean, if it weren't for the fact that Ronnie James Dio was still alive when they recorded it, I would say that J- Ronnie James Dio rolled over in his grave. But he was probably too busy just counting his money at that time. Uh, <laughs> oh, <man>. Royalties! <laughs> Anyway, first off, the World Tag Team Championships, NMM, Morrison, well, then known as Johnny Nitro, Joey Mercury, and Melina. I don't know about you, David, but I kind of miss Melina. Not her screaming, but I, I, I miss her as a valet and as a wrestler. I'm going to be honest with you. Um, Melina was one of the better divas at the time, and to be honest, that's kind of sad. Yeah, and she wasn't really all that conventionally attractive either. I mean, they did kind of play her up with the whole Hollywood Hollywood angle, but uh, she she wasn't conventionally attractive, but she wasn't ugly either. No, but I, but I mean, she was one of the better divas at the time, but unfortunately, you know, considering the standard of the divas division in 06, that's really not saying much. Yeah. Uh, they were facing. They were the uh, champions at the time, by the way, and they were facing off against uh, the artist, I believe, known then as the Hooligans, Paul London and Brian Kendrick. Now, uh, the last time I saw him, I think he was briefly in NXT as the Brian Kendrick. Yeah. Which haven't seen him since that match. Probably was just a one-time thing, but okay. Of course, uh, Joey Mercury, uh, most of you who will remember from more recently as part of uh, J&J Security with uh, Jamie Noble. And, uh, of course, this is uh, Johnny Nitro, as I mentioned, John Morrison, before he became a pastiche showed The Doors with a theme song that sounded more like Jimi Hendrix than The Doors. Yeah. Oh, the days when tag teams actually had gimmicks. You know? When tag teams were actually tag teams. And not just a couple of guys thrown together. Mm. Also, it should also be noted, I I miss Paul London. I honestly thought that 
he might have had a chance to get up maybe into the mid card at best in WWE. Yeah. Although, truth be told, if you want to see Paul London at his best work, go back to Ring of Honor. He's back in Ring of Honor right now, and I'm sure he's probably doing great work there now. But I'll definitely go back to his pre-WWE Ring of Honor days where he was facing off against the likes of Samoa Joe and AJ Styles. And, in fact, there was one match on uh, his initial Ring of Honor DVD called, entitled Please Don't Die, where he has a fantastic match with someone who would later become known as Daniel Bryan. American Dragon. Yeah. It, Good match, too. I saw that one. I, I've, actually, I've actually owned that DVD. It's probably gotten lost after a few uh, moves and such. But even so, that, that's, that and the Samoa Joe match are definitely my two favorite matches on that. Yeah. Uh, of course, Molina getting plenty of play as the uh, valet for M&M, M&M, though. It should be noted, Bird ain't one for screamers. <laughs> I mean, I, I can understand you being uh, uh, very uh, enthusiastic, but uh, I, I, I do have a little bit of uh, misophony. I, I'm a, I, I, I do, I am a little bit misophonic. Sometimes loud percussive noises and high pitched noises really get to me. Mm-hmm. You have no idea how long it took for me to get over the sound of balloons popping. I could imagine. Anyway, it's a long story. Yeah. Um, but yeah, th- this was also back in the day when tag team wrestling actually got good time on pay per view because this was a good long match. Um, and ultimately, uh, London and Kendrick won, which led some sim- with uh, some simple storytelling right into the end of this match. That further teased the breakup of Eminem on this match, and oh god, watching Molina, she was oh she was all fire, all kinds of fired up after that. Uh, Hell hath no fury like a woman whose team lost the tag team titles. <laughs> and then she blames Mercury on the match. Yeah, and then and then uh, and then uh, Nitro got fired by Teddy Long after assaulting him. Which, yeah, General Manager Teddy Long, that was a thing. A very very long time, by the way. No pun intended. <laughs> yeah. And after that, we have a match between uh, Dave Finlay, known in then as Fit Finlay, and. A superstar whose name has been lost to the mists of history. By which we mean Chris Benoit. (laughs) He who must not be named by WWE. (laughs) Uh, Real, real old school match there because both of them are known for being real old school. Uh, Chris Benoit being the more old school technician. Finlay being the more old school brawler. Um, And by the way, for those of you who think that Brock Lesnar really is the mayor of Suplex City... Roll back nine years earlier. Chris Benoit was doing this shit nine years ago. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, It was a good long match. Nice back and forth between them. Uh, There was a spot where Chris Ben... This was after the passing of uh, Eddie Guerrero. Uh, Right. And uh, there was a spot where Chris Benoit did do the Three Amigos because, of course... Chris Benoit was one of Eddie Guerrero was one of his closest friends. In fact, it was probably Eddie Guerrero's death that led partially to him going a little. Uh, at least I would venture to say, would probably let led to some of his depression that led to his uh, more uh, not great Suicide, decisions. Basically. Yeah. Uh, and uh, Chris Benoit got the win in this match with the yes lock. Uh, I'm sorry, Crippler Crossface. <laughs> New <laughs> habits die hard. Sorry. And now we have a match that, well, 
pretty much shows you the uh, state of the Divas division in 2006. A match that really got started at the makeup table between Melina and Jillian Hall. I never bought into Jillian. And in fact, her entrance, she has really generic wrestling gear, really generic person. Jillian did really well in the indies, though. Uh, there was a move, I remember at the time, people were YouTubing that she did, which was freaking awesome, but WWE wouldn't let her do it. Yeah, instead they gave her generic music and just made her a generic person. Which, to be perfectly honest, was better than the road they took her down towards the end of her run with WWE. Yeah. And this match really wasn't much to speak about. It ended up with a generic win with a generic roll-up that was generically controversial. Uh. <laughs> also, some chick named Crystal, who has been, who again has been lost to his, history, came in to interview Melina right after losing to Jillian Hall, which just goes to show that uh, timing is not a thing in WWE. Right. Uh, after this, uh, John Bradshaw Layfield was the U.S. champion back then. Right. Back when holding the U.S. title was actually a thing that meant something before John Cena started to build some prestige back to it. And he cut a backstage promo on his match against the then World Heavyweight Champion, Rey Mysterio. Yes, that was a thing that happened. Who was undergoing probably one of the worst runs, win-loss record-wise, as champion pretty much known. Yeah, before this match alone, Rey Mysterio was in three consecutive non-title matches for the three weeks leading up to Judgment Day. Against Kane, Mark Henry, and the Great Khali. And got destroyed in all three of them. Rey Mysterio's record going into this match as champion was, and this is really sad, 4 and 12, I believe. And I said this back then, and to this day, I still believe this. Rey Mysterio getting the championship was not a bad thing. No, it wasn't. It was accelerated because, again, of the ties to Eddie Guerrero. And it was booked very horribly, but it could have been done right. And, in fact, uh, and in fact, while, again, they kind of fucked this uh, up later, he did also get another World Heavyweight Championship run later, and a WWE Championship run for one day. More like 90 minutes. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, he, his luck holding the top title was probably not as good as it could have been. No, but his second run was fairly decent, although insignificant. Yeah. He looked more like a champion then than, than this horrifying run. Yeah. Uh, all through this pay-per-view, they were giving uh, flashbacks to the King of the Ring, because also at this was the finals of the 2006 King of the Ring tournament, which, by the way, and I know we alluded to this earlier with King Bear, why is the King gimmick a thing? Why, with rare exception, when people win the King of the Ring, do they suddenly believe that they are actually royal? In Barrett's case, it's because they have the Queen in England, I guess. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, that... I mean, King Mabel? <laughs> that was painful. King Booker? That one was... That one was interesting because he just, like, changed his voice, his persona, everything. No... 
Which, by the way, spoilers for a match later on, Booker won the 2006 King of the Ring. Yeah. And he would later go on to use that King gimmick in, well, at least the voice of the King gimmick, in TNA in some cases. Yeah. In fact, that was his second most annoying gimmick after WWE commentator. <laughs> Shucky, ducky, quack, quack. <laughs> Uh, anyway, uh, <laughs> we had the uh, Cruiserweight Championship uh, going on here. Again, while the Cruiserweight Championship still held some meaning. Uh, it was uh, Gregory Helms, uh, fresh off of not Gregory Helms stopping being uh, Hurricane. Yeah. Versus Super Crazy. Uh, I, I never understood Super Crazy. Well, the three Mexi Cools, well, he was like the one guy who pretty much just sat there and kind of just was like, I'm super! I'm crazy! I'm super crazy! And I, I don't understand. What was what was the point? ECW nostalgia. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, also Mexi Cools. Luch- Luchadors riding to the ring on retitled John Deere tractors, labeled <laughs> Juan Deere. <laughs> and people wonder why WWE sometimes gets called out for being racist. <laughs> no, I don't know how possibly they could think that. And uh, it should be noted that uh, whereas uh, Gregory Helms used to be kind of the more traditional uh, cruiserweight when he was the Hurricane, when he went back to being Gregory Helms, he kind of went back to his WCW more ground and pound kind of style. Uh, pro- probably because, of course, being a heel. Uh, there were four quick near falls at the beginning of this match. Uh, ultimately, Gregory Helms did retain the Cruiserweight Championship because he had his feet on the ropes. <laughs> oh, and I, I alluded to this earlier, but after that match, they did have the uh, they did have an angle with Molina and Nitro, both very, very, very angry. Uh, Molina slaps Teddy Long, at which point they got the boot. At which point he's like, "Get out." If that was a smart idea, Melina. Very smart. They, she really thought that one through. <laughs> yeah. Better days for Kurt Angle when he faced Mark Henry uh, at, at Judgment Day. Uh, before the match even starts, Henry already strips the announcer table. And that's pretty much a sign that somebody's going through it at some point in the day. By the way, I never did get this. What? Why is it that Mark Henry always comes out to the ring already soaked with sweat? Does he really work himself up that much in the gorilla position behind behind the curtain before he comes out? <laughs> or is he just that out of shape? <laughs> You would think the Ultimate Warrior would be sweating whenever he ran down to the ring, but he was perfectly fine. Also, while uh, this became more prominent when he did this in uh, in uh, TNA, uh, the whole words on the mouthpiece thing actually started while Kurt was in WWE. And in fact, he had the word revenge on his mouthpiece because uh, this was from the King of the Ring. They were kind of uh, feuding... From the uh, King of the Ring. Mm. Um, Mark Henry actually won by count out, if I remember correctly, from Kurt Angle actually being uh, uh, smashed through the pre stripped announce table. Uh, count outs on pay per view or special events are very, very ever satisfying to me. But when the face gets to come back and do a post match beatdown, that is. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we already mentioned uh, Booker T winning the King of the Ring finals. By the way, he won over Bobby, Bobby Lashley, who is now in TNA. 
wonderful, wonderful place his career went. Uh, Undertaker slumming it versus Kali. Great Kali. He was a thing. He was a winner. And that's all I'm going to say about that. Did you do any post-match interviews? <laughs> no. But finally... Uh, <laughs> finally, we do have the uh, World Heavyweight Championship match. Rey Mysterio, the champion, facing then-United States champion John Bradshaw Layfield. Uh, as we mentioned earlier, Rey getting beat up in successive weeks for this pay-per-view. Yeah. Pretty much didn't make him look like a credible champ, I'll be honest with you. Yeah. Although there was one cool spot fairly early on in the match where where uh, Ray distracts the referee with the classic look over there, there kind of thing, and then does a drop kick to, uh, well, how shall I put this, um, JBL's Longhorn. Hmm. And I don't mean the one on his car. <laughs> um, we had a second Three Amigos spot in this match, only it wasn't by Ray. It was a mocking one by JBO. Yeah. Uh, finish to the match, though. Uh, Ray does a 619, goes up, does a frog, frog splash. Un, deux, trois, or should I say uno, dos, tres. Ray retains. All in all, um, I'm going to give this pay-per-view three Unicursal Hexagrams. It, it, it wasn't a bad pay-per-view. It was actually pretty good. There were some snoozers there, but it, 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 was, it was pretty good. I'm going to go with two and three quarters. Uh, like you said, fairly solid where it's supposed to be. There was not really many highs, not really many lows. It was just there. It was a very forgettable pay-per-view, though. Uh, highlighted, I, at least in my opinion, by uh, more, not so much the wrestling part, but that there was a lot of fairly decent promos. And in my opinion, one especially by JBL, who I thought was very, very good on the mic. Yeah, that was when he was doing, like, the real, real hyper-conservative racist heel then. Yeah. And, and he was really good at it. He was really darn good at it. Which, by the way, I happen, I happen to later on realize that he is not as hyper-conservative as he played up that gimmick to be. Yeah. So... And uh, I'm actually going to take some video of this as a behind-the-scenes special for you all. It is now time to roll our little time machine, our 2D20s. Uh, I'm going the... to roll mine here. You found it? Yeah, I found it. Okay. Yeah, I, I lost my D20 earlier, so, uh, so we can just go ahead and, uh, yeah, I can roll it. Okay. And uh, like I said, as a little behind the scenes, you're going to have a little video of me actually uh, rolling this uh, on my, uh, uh, taking the pick off of my uh, video camera using the uh, dice that you will see depicted on our Instagram, instagram.com slash casual mode podcast. Uh, the one I affectionately refer to as the shiny Umbreon die, because as you can see, it is black with some red speckles to resemble Shining on Brown's eyes, and the numbers are the uh, cyan color that I love so much from the Shiny. So, here we go. Rolling. And it three. looks like... You got a what? I got a three. I got a nine. So, that means the total is going to be 12, which takes us back to... 2003. You're getting a lot of uh, 2000s pay-per-views, I tell you what. Yeah, well, at least we haven't had to uh, do our little minus for some of the older stuff yet. Yeah, that's true. But, but yeah, 2003, all right. So, uh, yeah, we'll find something in June of 2003 in the next Wrestle Roll Rewind. All right, so 
That's it for the oldest established permanent floating segment of the show. Coming up next, silly news and dumb tweets. Okay, we're recording. All right. All right, closing segment, silly news and dumb tweets in three, two, one. As always, we like to close the show with silly news and dumb tweets, but we're going to start us off actually with some uh, really, really good news, especially for those of us who aren't actually narcissistic. From the AV Club, which is the first time we've ever gotten a story source from this particular space, hopefully we'll have more in the future, Disney asked visitors not to wave three-foot-long metal poles around on the rides. In case you're wondering what that's referring to, I'll read you the story proper. Management at Florida's Disney World theme park, maintaining a bright level tone and a chipper rigid composure, have requested that visitors to the park no longer use selfie sticks while riding on the rides. (laughs) The rides move very fast, you see. The company did not go on to add. (laughs) I hint of a twitch flickering in the corner of its glimmering eye. And waving around metal poles with cell phones on the end might be dangerous. (laughs) No, really? Disney joins music festivals Coachella and Lollapalooza in banning the, quote, narcissistics which allow users additional angles and reach when taking pictures of themselves with their phones and also entrances for certain NXT superstars. By the way, best part about Tyler Breeze's new entrance? You know. (laughs) Yeah, no selfie stick. (laughs) To be fair to the monolithic company, though, it's relatively unlikely that selfie stick use at Coachella would end up with a four-year-old getting a concussion because some butterfingered shutterbug accidentally hurled his pricey camera toy with all the rotational force of a ferociously spinning teacup. <laughs> <laughs> Disney did note that visitors were welcome to use the sticks in parts of the park that did not involve people being rapidly propelled through space at velocities reaching as much as 30 miles an hour. So, there you go, selfie stickers. Feel free to take all the pictures you want of yourself around the park, Content in the knowledge that the dehydrated Orlando-born teen with the goofy-suited arm around your shoulder does not hate you for fiddling with your camera while he slowly sweats to death and does not wish to beat you with your stick. (laughs) I swear, I I wish I was the person who came up with the selfie stick. It sounds so simple. Like, you basically just take a golf club and you tape a cell phone to the putting end of it. Uh, still, all hail the mouse. All <laughs> hail the mouse. Uh. Still, I, I really do wish that I would have come up with that because I cannot believe how popular that appliance has gotten. It, there is no point in needing a selfie stick. I'm sorry, there isn't. This next one comes from a website lovingly titled WeHuntedTheMammoth.com, which, uh, for those of you who don't know about the website, as I did not before this particular story, uh, focuses on mocking uh, the way misogyny is being handled online these days, uh, especially with folks like uh, men's rights activists, men going their own way, MGTOWs, and the the pickup artist assholes. Well, those guys in the ass... This story is really going to make you question the sanity of uh, some of the people involved. The headline, White supremacists are convinced that a Nickelodeon show about a girl quarterback is promoting, quote, race cuckoldry, unquote. What? Repugnant, quote, game, unquote, guru, artiste, and of course we mean game not as in, like, controllers, but game as in, ooh! Uh, oh, yeah, the guy who made the dating market value for men and women that pretty much everyone at my old forum used to describe how, you know... Yeah, according to, yeah, according to the sp- story, he specializes in dating advice to sp- aimed at aspiring emotional abusers, seems to be trying to launch a second career as kind of a white supremacist Nostradamus. 
In a post this Tuesday, he predicted an imminent uprising by the white masses against the, quote, cultural elites and, quote, and evil, quote, leftoids who have been, I don't know, suppressing them somehow with multiculturalism or something. Uh, well, whatever it is the leftoids have been doing, Hartis thinks they'll soon be facing their day of reckoning. Quote from the asshole. Do the Western cultural elite have a death wish? Do they want normal good people to hate them with a fury? Because that's what's going to happen if they don't keep it up. And the washout won't be pretty in pink. It's time to turn to lessons from Weimar Republic Germany and the cataclysm that can bring doom to the earth when a native people feel cornered and despised by their own elite and the dominant culture. The lamppost swingularity, the point at which the intensity of leftoid propaganda exceeds the tolerance level of the targets of leftoid hatred, is closer than you think, end quote. What is the possible trigger for this lamppost swingularity? A kid show on Nickelodeon called Bella and the Bulldogs. Its premise is, quoting IMDb, a perky head cheerleader named Bella whose life in Texas takes an unexpected twist when she becomes the new quarterback for her school team, the Bulldogs. No, really. A kid show about a cheerleader turned quarterback. So how could this possibly be anything race-related? Well, uh, as seen, well, for one thing, this is part of a conspiracy theory that's been making the rounds on uh, Reddit, 4chan, and the even worse variant, 8chan. 8chan because it's twice as bad? Apparently. Oh. It seems someone discovered that one of the show's co-creators, Jonathan Butler is apparently the same guy who, under the name Jonathan Corbin Butler, wrote and directed a movie, a straight-to-DVD drama called The Cuckold, looking at what Butler calls, quote, a little-known fetish in the swinging lifestyle called cuckolding. That is, black men having sex with white women while their white husbands look on. I have no idea if this is actually true or not. But this discovery has convinced an assortment of racist conspiracy theorists, among of them Hartiste, that Bella and the Bulldogs is itself somehow a show about race cucking. Given the show is, you know, a Nickelodeon sitcom and kids that does not actually depict any sex acts, the people writing this story and us here at Casual Mode have no idea how this is actually supposed to work. Regardless, the conspiracy theories and theorists have been busy spinning their little webs. Here's one summary from the 4chan subreddit. Okay, I gotta, I gotta listen to this. Go ahead. Fire it away. All right. Too, TLDR, too long, didn't read. A uh, producer whose entire writing career consists of interracial cuckold fetishism has written a Nickelodeon show that seems to have elements of, you guessed it, cuckold fetishism. The white male characters are seen to be either weak or evil. What? And from all... And from the trailers, all the evil characters are given a southern accent. The weakest of the white characters possesses the number 99 on his sports jacket, i.e. last place. The team name, of course, being the Bulldogs. Bull, bull being a highly used term for interracial cuckold fetishists. What? The white lead female, who is also the football quarterback, is given the number 1. This shows the numerical symbolism behind the jackets, and thus every, that everything in the show is highly planned out. The Jewish white kid, while, who, while weak, is not evil, is given the number 27, a symbolic number for the Holocaust. What? The black student is given the number 8, which, according to the picture, represents the black 8-ball, but also, in Christian eschatology and mythology, represents wor worldly perfection. See the book of Revelation. Okay, I'm going to stop right there for a second. When your racist conspiracy theory involves evoking the book of Revelation, you are going into a different level of batshit. What? Allow me to continue. Wow! Allow me to Someone continue. has gone, like, to the upper class of the Alex Jones school of paranoia here. Allow me to continue. The male lead and love interest of the female lead is black. There's a trailer for an episode named Trader Dater on YouTube, which I'm pretty certain had, would have to do with a different team rather than a different race, just from the nature of the show. Whenever the white female lead is shown in TV cover images, 
the, quote, dog part of her jersey is covered by her hair, leaving only the, quote, bull part. She is, in all the images, shown closest to her future male love interest, the bull. Literally something out of white supremacist fan fiction. Edit, banned because my TLDR was too long. Thanks, mods. Yes, actually, thank you, mods, for banning this asshole. Wow. I'm you not... had to put a lot of effort to make up something like that. Yeah. Now, there is there is an episode in which the uh, black male lead, Troy, uh, while never actually dates Bella, does pretend to be her boyfriend uh, for sitcom reasons involving ballet lessons, lessons, but that's the closest to interracial dating the show has gotten to. In fact, the only boy she's ever been seen dating is a guy named Kyle. White guy, by the way. <laughs> Further quotes of stupidity, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wrap this up here. I... I... Uh, from Hartiste, by the way. Bella and the Bulldogs, promoting anti-white and consequently pro-black race cucking, wallows in a panoply of filth and lies. Not sure that word means what you think it means. Ridiculous girl power, girl power fantasy, that's with two R's, no I. Check. We whites with a Y. Check. Evil redneck whites. Check. Numinous Negroes, again. Not sure that word means what you think it means. Also, congrats on using the racial slur, you dumbass. Check. Transgenderism? Good lord and, lord and butter. What? We may have to check that one off, too. Uh, first off, uh, I remember uh, Hartiste from those days by the name of Royce. Uh better known by his real name, James C. Weidman. Uh, uh, he makes, he makes uh, the Evangelical Council, the Family Research Council, look like just swell guys in comparison. This, okay, I had to look this up because... It's been a while since I've actually dabbled with this kind of shit. And uh, actually, apparently he was not, well, at least at the time, he was not considered a white nationalist. But yeah, according to Rational Wiki, get ready for this. One of his uh, claims to fame is his claim that Adolf Hitler could not have started World War II because he was a beta male. What? Mm hmm. Okay, I, we've gone too long with this, this now. I'm going to wrap this up by reminding you, you all, one more time, that the show that is making these white supremacist heads explode is a Nickelodeon show about a perky cheerleader who becomes a quarterback. And that is, again, a direct quote from this story on We Hunted the Mammoth. I gotta watch this and uh, I gotta watch this show and just do like a review of it or something. Yeah, this, this is not the kind of TV show I would want to watch, but just from the concept, it looks actually like a pretty damn interesting show. I don't yeah, see I how it's white, how it's anti-white at all. I took the Brony challenge. It can't be much worse. In fact, if anything, it's probably a very empowering show for girls, especially ones who want to get into sports. I think that's why Roy C slash Hartiste hates it so much. Yeah, that's probably true. Anyway, uh, moving on to a story from uh, The Mirror uh, from UK. Uh, trope unlocked. Of course he's alive. Student doctors party with a corpse while on call at the hospital. Nine medical students have been suspended for partying with a corpse while they were on call at a hospital. One intern moved the dead man's body from a corridor next to A&E after it was left unattended. No, not the TV channel. They put a drink in his hand as they partied during one of their last shifts before becoming fully qualified doctors. The dead man's relatives are understood to have found him in a restroom they used at the Hospital de Clinicas in the Uruguayan capital, Montevideo. Nine of the eight students who took part in the Barzar Toast have been suspended for a month. 
the punishment now means that they will fully qualify as fully fledged doctors next year at the earliest instead of this July. You remember that 80s movie uh, Weekend at Bernie's? Yeah. Clearly, these people took that to be a documentary. <laughs> yeah. And and they were this close to becoming full doctors. And they threw it away because they wanted to get crunk. <laughs> uh, boy. Anyway. I got and I got nothing to describe that. Uh, I, another one from the mirror. Uh, you're going to love this headline. It was brown. It was everywhere. Family party ruined as human poo rains down from plane overhead. <laughs> and uh, for those of you who are looking at the link that we've put in the show notes, there is video here, so enjoy. <laughs> oh my God. A plane allegedly dropped human waste mid-flight, covering a 16th birthday party in Pooh. The event was ruined when Pooh rained down, covering the garden. And there are actually pictures of splatters of Pooh on the canopy. Uh, more than 40 guests were horrified when human waste suddenly fell from overhead just minutes after they had cut the birthday cake. <laughs> I'm sorry. I can't resist. Happy birthday to Pooh. Happy birthday. <laughs> Happy birthday, dear feces. <laughs> Happy birthday, here's Pooh. <laughs> Kirsty Rogie, a guest at the party in Pennsylvania, told WNEP News, We just got done with the cake. Thank God we took the cake back in because within two minutes something fell from the sky. It was brown, it was everywhere, it got on everything. A uh, canopy set up in the yard was uh, helped to shield some of the guests from the feces. The family now believes the human waste was dropped from a plane flying overhead. They have identified five planes that were in the area at the time. Regulations require planes to dispose of waste at an airport, so the FAA is, in, is investigating the incident. You know, I, I, I've heard of the whole blue ice dropping myth. Never heard of brown ice. <laughs> I mean, although it has to be said, clearly this was one shitty party. This news was a load of shit. <laughs> but let's not crap on this family too much. <laughs> oh, man. It, it, I, I will laugh if they found out find out that it's the number two flight that went over. <laughs> <sighs> I, I'm wasting all the good puns on this story. <laughs> oh. Anyway, we're going to end the uh, silly news with actually something that's kind of heartwarming because really this... You know, we talk smack about America a lot here and about the dumb shit that our country does. But in truth, both of us do love the United States because it is our home country. And there are some good things about it, as evidenced in this next story, which if it doesn't at least make you say ah once, you probably don't have much of a soul in you. Seattle couple leaves 80... $850,000 estate to the U.S. government. From, this one comes off of KOCO.com by way of CNN Money, uh, Dateline, New York. A Seattle company left nearly $850,000 to the U.S. government as a gesture of thanks to their adopted country. Peter Petrasek, who emigrated from Czechoslovakia after World War II, and his wife Joan, stipulated in their will that all of their money be donated to the government. The couple had no children and wanted to give back to the country that enabled them to live a happy and prosperous life. Said Peter Wynn, the U.S. attorney who helped transfer the funds to the Treasury Department. Quote Wynn, I think the Petroseks were very grateful to their adopted country. They wanted to make a statement about how much it meant to them to be able to call themselves American citizens. End quote. 
Peter, an engineer for a local steel company, died in 2012 at the age of 85. Joan, who was from Ireland, died several years earlier of breast cancer at 79. The couple met in Canada before settling in Seattle, according to Carrie Balkema, the attorney who oversaw the liquidation of their estate. The couple's assets included their home, savings, and a substantial stock portfolio. Balkema said Peter went back to Czechoslovakia several years ago to see if any of his relatives had survived World War II. He couldn't find any. Though Joan had some relatives in Ireland, the company wanted their money to go to America. Quote Balkema, who was appointed by the court to figure out how to fulfill the couple's unusual request, both felt they were given opportunities and education by coming here. On May the 13th, Wynn said he deposited a check on behalf of the Petrosec estate in the amount of $847,215.57 made out to the Department of the Treasury. When wow. people talk about the best parts of America and say that it's a land of opportunity, this kind of stuff is what they're talking about. Two people who emigrated to this country from one from Eastern Europe, one from Ireland, coming to this country pretty much with nothing, getting together in Canada, deciding to start a family together, making their life in Seattle, and making such a life for themselves that they had a substantial estate. While they had no one to pass it along to, they felt it they felt that leaving that as a symbolic gesture of the thankfulness that they had for the parts of America that are actually, I would say, American, is and that's a really nice gesture for them. I can understand why they did it, and yeah, like I said, if, if that doesn't make you at least think the word awe, you really need to examine your life. <laughs> Yeah, I know. It, it, it was it was really nice. Really nice. Yeah, all right. Yeah, I'm fine. Sorry, I'm just a little tired. <laughs> I didn't sleep last night. Yeah, yeah, it, 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 and we've talked an awful lot as well. So uh, let's it go. Quite, it's been quite a long episode, admittedly. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, let's escorate the imbecilic, shall we? All righty. So first one. Uh, here's a nice little picture here for you guys. Uh, thanks to whoever put a tree on our baseball field. Yeah, kind of a little embarrassing there. I have no idea where that tree could have possibly come from. Someone stole our freaking tree. Like a full-grown 15-foot tree. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Why would you put a tree on a baseball field? I mean, you're you're just asking for disaster. Either A, oh. the ball's going to get stuck in the branches, or B, somebody's going to be chasing a pop fly and boom! For the lulls. Clotheslined by a low-hanging branch. Yeah. Talk, talk about a seven... You wouldn't have a seventh-inning stretch in that case. You'd have a seventh-inning stretcher. <laughs> uh, yeah. Next one... Uh, uh, here's a picture of a guy showing name a coffee cup, and he says, "I said my name was Mark with a C." <laughs> Kark. <laughs> yeah, so, sometimes some Starbucks baristas not exactly known for being the best with spelling. Either that, or they don't care. Yeah, pretty much. This next one. Oh, uh, okay, okay. Just look at this chick's face here. Look at the girl's face. When you find yourself beating up the third side bitch this week and you realize he might not be shit. <laughs> Just that face, man. I can't actually see the picture right now, so I'll have to take your word for it. Uh, okay, okay. She's got like this Kevin Owens look to her. <laughs> this monotone Kevin Owens look. This very just, I just don't... I don't care. I'm beating this guy up. I don't care. <laughs> yeah. Hilarious. Okay. So uh, the Discovery Channel and the Pittsburgh Penguins decided to trade jabs at each other. 
Discovery Channel starts with, on average, emperor penguins grow to be 3.8 feet tall. The Pittsburgh Penguins respond, as of May 13, 2015, the average Pittsburgh Penguin grows to be 6 foot 1. To which Discovery responds, strange, our latest observations show no penguin activity currently on ice in Pittsburgh. Where did they go? <laughs> Hashtag shots fired. Ooh, burn. Apply See you in the playoffs. Oh, the wait. Area. <laughs> Apply ice to the burned area. <laughs> oh, wow. That's some serious shade being thrown there by Discovery. I, I, yeah. I, I wish they'd save some of that for TNA, though. Uh, <laughs> Here's another one. Um, ha- uh, the uh, I'm going to show the username here of Crappy. Actually, I'm surprised that they got such a short name on Twitter. That's that's actually pretty nice. Must have been a long, long time ago. Anyway, why does Miley Cyrus look like Hannah Montana? I wonder. You know, I sometimes wonder that myself. And then I realize, oh wait, is because she was on that show. Here's some. Uh, here's the guy who probably should not have been a parent. Honestly, uh, here's a picture for you. My son told me I should have used a condom if I don't like his ma, so I put the lamp over his head since he's so bright. See, if you'd have put something over your own head, you wouldn't have had to deal with his smart mouth. and finally there's a girl who finally got that diamond T2 (laughs) it's not a diamond it's a heart (laughs) you know I don't think this girl's playing playing with a full deck (laughs) and I really don't think that tattoo suits her Mm. <laughs> I think maybe she got clubbed as a child. <laughs> but hey, just calling a spade a spade. <laughs> nice. You're quite the joker. <laughs> I'm the king. What can I say? <laughs> oh well. Although it could be argu- it could be argued in some ways I'm also the queen. Uh, <laughs> oh. Well. Enough of this. Uh, enough of this stuff. That was just enough uh, jacking off to the twins. <laughs> oh. Ten nine eight seven six five four three two. That is all for tweets. <laughs> Dumb tweets. Sorry. Yeah, we aced that segment. <laughs> <laughs> oh, anyway, if you want to get a hold of us and uh, yell at us for all these terrible puns that we've made on this episode. Then uh, there are very many ways that you can do that, David. Yes. First, up, first off, you will not be able to contact me for the next little while because I'm taking a bicycle to lunch. <laughs> <laughs> and check us out: casualmodepodcast.com, facebook.com slash casualmodepodcast, Twitter at zero at shadowbird seven twelve. Check us out on uh, iTunes, YouTube, Instagram. Stumble up. Upon, stumble upon uh, the username being casual mode, and of course, finally, uh, Instagram. No, my Pinterest. I already said Instagram. Oh, yeah. <laughs> All, yeah. Also, Pinterest, uh, my personal Pinterest account. Yeah. Also, keep in mind our subscriber uh, giveaway is still going. You still have a chance to uh, win a twenty dollars gift card of your choice between uh, four different options. If you're in the U.S., three. If you're not in the U.S., I'm. F- we're sorry, but that's just the way the eShop cards work in this country. So, yeah. anyway, until next time, I'm Jeremy. I'm David. Lady, y'all. Ah. Uh. <laughs>